Okay, we are now recording. All right. Good morning, everyone. Happy Monday. Welcome to the Board of Trustees uh, meeting. This is a special meeting of our group. As a reminder, this uh, meeting is being recorded. Um, Madam Secretary, may I get a roll call uh, of attendance, please? Vera Hona. Present. Buenaventura. Present. Chen. Cisneros. Here. Good. Here. Huser. Here. Shelby. Present. Stevens. Present. Sowell. Present. Stallings. Present. Tony. Present. Trejo. Present. You have a quorum. All right. Thank you everyone for your availability today. Next up on our agenda is a call for public comment. State Bar staff will attempt to call members of the public in order uh, that they appear in the attendee pool. For those of you part participating via Zoom, uh, you should have a function for virtually raising your hand. It is a hand icon. It should appear at the bottom center of your screen. If you wish to address the board, please click on the hand icon now and State Bar staff will call on you in the order that hands are raised. For those of you participating via phone, you may virtually raise your hand by pressing star nine. That is the star, star key, then number nine. And in doing so will alert staff that you would like to make a comment. And State Bar staff will call on you and open your microphone so you can address the board. For those of you uh, who are participating from a notice location, please alert the State Bar staff member present in the room that, um, that you would like to make comment. So due to time restrictions, we cannot allow more than three minutes for each speaker. So please note that staff will have an on-screen countdown timer visible to all attendees during the duration of your public comment. The timer's three minute countdown will begin as soon as you start your comment. The on-screen timer will flash throughout the final 10 seconds. And move first to our uh, members who signed up or individuals who signed up in advance. So Lisa, can you uh, walk us through that? Yes, um, the first individual and the only individual who signed up in advance is with the phone number ending in 7215. And I do see that person in attendance. All right. Um, so if you could please identify yourself for the record and then uh, please address our, uh, our board. Um, your mic has been enabled. You just need to unmute in order to address the board. All right, we still cannot hear you. All right, looks like we're having some technical difficulties, so we'll come back to the phone number ending in 7215. Um, any other uh, individuals who have signed up ahead of time? Yes, we have Car no, not signed up in advance, but we do see Caroline Shining, who has their hand raised and would like to address the board. Okay. Um, thank you. And um, my name is Caroline Shining. I am an attorney licensed in, uh, in California. I'm speaking on behalf of myself as an individual. And I um, thank the board for uh, for being here and for allowing public comment. I know your time is valuable and I'll try and keep my comments short. Um, I understand that today you will be considering the 2024-2025 budget. And I, I am concerned that the 2025 related issues with regard to the changes that are coming um, have not been allowed to be fully vetted and considered by practicing attorneys. Um, there are the word disruption is something that is used in the venture capital world to talk about changes that can be made to uh, commercial environments for the benefit of, of consumers and members of the public. However, State Bar proposed changes in the past with regard to non-attorney ownership, sometimes called an alternative business structure, uh, paraprofessionals and clinical paths to licensure have generated thousands of critical comments uh, that have um, may or may not been considered in terms of with, with the responses of the State Bar to those criticisms. I would urge the State Bar to give more time for consideration of these kinds of major disruptive proposals, um, 30 days for the portfolio bar examination, for example, 45 days for uh, major programs such as the paraprofessionals. I think on, on a positive note, 
that kind of more time and full engagement with the practicing eternity community can result in positive um, co coalitions that will result in real changes to help the uh, consumers of California. I commend um, Leah Wilson for reaching out to uh, local bar associations to try and make sure we can bridge those gaps and to really talk with practicing attorney communities uh, in the coming year. And I just wish the board and I hope the board can take the time as it comes to the 2025 proposals um, that are currently being thought through and discussed. And as we study Arizona and Utah and Washington to really help um, the bar associations who are boots on the ground for practicing attorneys who are involved in community legal services and support to give a very considered thought to what those practicing attorneys can do to help support the missions of the state bar. And with that, um, I'll end my public comment and thank you all again for your time and consideration. All right, thank you for addressing our board. Madam Secretary. Uh, we do have one additional person. Um, this person's name is E6HUGWI. Your mic should be enabled and you should be able to address the board. Hi there, good morning, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, sorry, earlier I was calling from my phone. That was the 7215 number. I'm also um, addressing the board in my individual capacity. Uh, my name is Candace Lee. Good morning. And I will also try and keep this succinct. Um, I am told that the California State Bar is in the process of considering rule changes permitting retroactive ex expungement of administrative inactive enrollments. I'm calling to support such rule changes where an attorney was otherwise in compliance with all licensing requirements but not did not submit the forms or pay the fees on time. Um, I was on disability leave and my company moved its physical office address, so I unfortunately never received notices reminding me to pay my dues and complete the related forms. Uh, once I returned to work with a new employer, I went to update my state bar profile and realizing the error, I immediately submitted my CTAP form and paid my dues, including a $500 late penalty fee. Um, I was told that because I incurred inactive enrollment for CTAP noncompliance, in addition to failing to pay my dues, that I'm ineligible for expungement per California Rural Court um, Section 9.8B4. Therefore, there's a mark on my record indicating that I was ineligible to practice law in 2023 and that that notation will stay on my record permanently. Um, as the State Bar's mission is to protect the public and enhance the administration of justice, I would uh, strongly posit that this rule does not um, serve this purpose if the uh, attorney is otherwise in compliance with all licensing requirements. Um, you know, for example, that attorney has not commingled funds, they satisfied their legal education requirements, which I have and had, um, other than, of course, the failure to pay the dues. And um, this will, however, greatly harm a professional's reputation while this notation appears on their bio permanently. Um, in extenuating circumstances such as these, I respectfully ask the California State Bar to reconsider this policy and strongly support a change to the rule permitting expungement of administrative inactive enrollments. All right, thank you for your comments. Madam Secretary? I do not have any additional members of the, of the public wishing to address the board. All right, thank you everyone for your thoughts and for sharing them with us. Um, we'll move next to uh, Chair's report, which is item 30. Um, I'll keep it brief in the interest of all that we have going on today. Uh, just that uh, myself, uh, Vice Chair Cisneros, have been uh, very busy meeting with various stakeholders. Um, I know members of staff, other trustees have also uh, started this year off uh, running, as it were. And uh, it's hard to believe that it's almost the end of February. Uh, we have a lot to accomplish this year and a lot uh, to uh, inform our various stakeholders about in today's meeting. So I look forward to uh, the media discussion that we're going to be having with the uh, three, um, three reports that we'll be releasing shortly. That concludes my uh, brief remarks. Um, we'll move on to, if everybody, um, 
I'm sure has probably picked this up. Our consent agenda will be taken up after our um, item 701 and 702. So um, stay tuned for that. But I do want to move on to 701, which is uh, approval of state bar final 2024 budget pursuant to business and professions code 6140 dash, or excuse me, point one. And this is uh, being presented by our chief financial officer, RSLA Montoya Chico. So welcome. Happy Monday. Thank you. Happy Monday and good morning. Um, I'm going to start with uh, the presentation for approval of the state bar budget for 2024. Um, hopefully you guys all uh, got to read the agenda and within the agenda is the link to our brand new format of the budget and uh, in fully and it's, it's very interactive. So I'm going to be sharing my screen uh, as I go through the budget. I'm not going to go through every single one of, of the pages, if you will, of the um, online budget, but um, I will I will highlight the key pieces and I'm going to follow the agenda item that was attached to this item. So please let me know once you see my screen. We can see it ourselves. Can we see it? Okay, great. Thank you. So as I said, this is a, a brand new format that we've uh, done from prior years. Prior years, it was just, a, a, you know, normal PDF. This is a lot more interactive. So hopefully you guys have had, um, the board has had a, a bit of time to go through the various uh, slides and links within. I will only highlight um, certain certain key pieces of, of the budget and scroll through some of the pages here. So first I wanna start off with our far-wide budget results. Um, and I'll start off with revenues followed by expenses and then I'll be covering the general fund um, as well as the admissions fund. And then I'll go over the reserves um, and, and touch on the forecast, uh, how to develop the forecast really quickly. So first for revenue, um, our total bar wide uh, revenue is about just under $430 million. And I wanted to show the sources of funds, which obviously um, $430 million is a lot, but really most of that is grant revenue and all grant revenue and, and grant uh, really is all grant revenue is passed through and it accounts for really most of our bar wide revenue, almost um, just over 65%. And the next uh, piece of, or the next source of funds for revenue is the mandatory fees. So this is our revenue budget for 2024. Um, you'll see that this year uh, in recommendation of the state auditor, uh, we're doing a five-year budget. So you will see in all of your budget or all of your budgets by fund, our 2023, uh, which is prior year's budget, our current budget of 2024, and then three years worth of forecast. So this is a new format that we will have and it's a recommendation of the state auditor to have those um, additional forecasted years. Um, again, as I mentioned, for about for, just under $430 million is our revenue. Uh, most of that, of course, is grants at about 280, just, just under 281 million. And the next piece of course is mandatory fees at 90, almost 98 million. Um, and yeah, sorry, I'm still trying to get used to this as well. So the next, I'm gonna move uh, over to the expense portion. Mark, you raised your hand. Could, could I ask something on that slide you just had up, please? Yes. Um, um, so I understand why the 2024 total revenues has a bump, uh, partly because of the sale of the building. Okay. What I, um, and then in 2025, it's kind of more in line with a, uh, small, uh, increase from 2023. I'm looking at 20... 27 and it looks like the amount is lower is that is that just because of grants or i mean i mean because you know the grants kind of throws things off so is that it yes and it, and it really is if you look at this grants line grants line well yeah. I I can. it goes from 280 million in 2024 to 196 million in 25 down to 186 and then down to 164 million um, and a lot of that is is driven by um, primarily the Legal Services Trust Fund IOLTA, but we are expecting a decrease in grant revenues, and that really is the biggest piece that's driving the decrease in, in funds. And you'll see on the other side, on the expense side, you'll right. see an increase in expenses also, <clears throat> grant-related expenses in 25, and then it also decreases in 26. 
Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. And all grant revenue is passed through for the most part. Most of it gets passed through to our subrecipients. Thank you. Sure. So moving on to the... Or is Sally Arnie yeah. had his hand up also. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see Arnie. Just real quick, Sally. one of the things that we've uh, enjoyed is uh, the interest rates being as high as they are and uh, generating a fair amount of revenue for us. And, and um, how is that being modeled uh, in the out years? Um, we, yes, you're right. You will, you will see that better in the general fund. Uh, a lot of the revenues, a lot of the investment income is sitting in the revenue. Um, that is our, in our other, in our other revenue categories that we have, you know, we have applied a 3% uh, CPI increase to our revenue categories as well. Um, it's, it's hard to predict, you know, what the rates are going to be in 2027. Um, we have seen 2023 perform really well. We anticipate 2024 rates to continue more or less in line, but I know the Fed is planning on decreasing the rate. Um, what future years will look like exactly? You know, that's that's what we're, uh, I don't know, but in terms of what we what we did in the forecast is we did apply um, the CPI increase also to the revenues that were not mandatory fees. Does that answer your question, yeah. Arnie? Okay. So hey, are, are, Sally, are you okay taking questions as we go throughout? Um, we, it would be, or, I, if I could get through, maybe the questions can come afterwards as we've normally done, but um, if that works for you, Brandon. And, and yeah, if we could forward. keep questions um, for the end, that'd be, that'd be great. Okay. And I'll try to get through my sections quickly. So really uh, briefly on the uh, expense sites, we're about 400, just under 401 million on the expenses. Again, if you look at the various expense components, grant drives most of those expenses. Um, as um, Mark asked, our grant expenses are planning, there's a spike in 2024 and 2025. Uh, the uh, Office of Access and Inclusion is planning on doing significant disbursements primarily from IOLTA revenues that have been pretty pretty significant and, and have exceeded our expectations. And then they, uh, they kind of, uh, decrease the rest of 2025, excuse me, 2026 and 2027. Um, the other piece that's also increasing is personal costs. As you can see, it's, it's increasing year over year. Um, and that's really just due to our, our mandatory um, merit increases that uh, those who qualify get, as well as COLA increases uh, only through 2025. This budget bar wide does not assume any COLA increases uh, for 2026 and 2027 since we don't have a negotiated uh, MOU in place for those years. So we, I'll talk about it a little bit in my forecast uh, slide, but there is no assumption of COLA increases in later years. Um, so now I wanna move on to the general fund budget. And this is, I clicked it uh, through the last page, if you will, slide 10 brings you up to the general fund, to the funds by budget. Um, and I'll start with the general fund. So I'll focus, I know this is a lot of numbers, but I'll focus on the 2024 budget um, and then the forecast years. Um, so in the general fund, as you can see, our revenue for 2024 is about 96 million, just over 96 million. Of course, most of that is composed by mandatory fees um, of about 87 million. Our expenses are close to 118 million. So that brings us to a deficit of about 22 million for 2024. Um, on the revenue side, of course, um, there's the mandatory fee increases. Uh, I do want to point that for future years, you see it doesn't increase all that much. And that's because we are seeing, or, or we budgeted not a significant growth in licensee counts, but we are doing an analysis and I'll talk a little bit uh, more about it to figure out what is our licensee growth going to look like since for the general fund, really that drives most of the revenue, as you can see. On the expenses, and of course, personal cost is our biggest expenditure. It's increasing and it's really mainly due to our COLA, again, as I mentioned, our COLA, mandatory COLA that we have to do through 2025, our merit increases, um, and as well as 2024, we saw a significant increase in healthcare rates. So we're projecting that outwards as well. Um, and within the budget, I highlighted that in the expenses, we also have about $7 million, just over $7 million of one-time investments uh, that we're incurring in 2024. Um, so those are you know, the LA elevator upgrade, the digitization as uh, as we, the digitization and San Francisco office um, space reduction that we have to move into later on this year. Um, 
to name a few others, there's a five-year update on the radi radical disparity study, a uh, five-year update on the justice gap, um, our phone system update for the for the um, for the contact center, and and a few others um, that are mentioned. But in total, it's about seven million dollars of one-time expenses that are included in our 2024 budget. Um, as you see in 2025 and 2020, 2025 through 2027. The deficit does increase, um, not significantly, but again, a lot of those one-time expenses kind of go away. Um, okay. So now I'm gonna move really quick into the uh, admissions fund um, that I wanna highlight. I'll start with the revenue. So the admissions fund is another fund that we've historically um, have highlighted and it's because they have experienced an ongoing structural deficit um, as we recall, there was a lot of uh, discussion last year and, and approval of to increase some of the admissions fees. So that certainly has helped close the admissions uh, structural deficit spending. Um, and in terms of revenues for 2024, uh, admissions fund is about 20, just over $26 million, uh, which compared to 2023, as you can see um, from 19, almost $20 million to $26 million, that's almost entirely really from the increase in all of the uh, admissions programs that we were able to increase. Uh, in 2023 that are effective in 2024. Now in terms of expenses, uh, they're budgeted at about 30, just under $31 million for admission and expenses. Um, so they have a deficit in 2024 of about just under 4 million, 3.8 million is the deficit spending for admissions. Um, obviously for uh, admissions, personal cost is also the biggest component. Um, you know, merit increases, COLAs, um, healthcare rates that impacts every single fund across the bar. So that accounts for admissions biggest expenses. You'll see the next the next largest expense category is indirect costs. Um, and indirect costs did increase from 2023 by almost $2.6 million. And that's really a result of these one-time expenses. The admissions fund takes about, accounts for about 16, maybe 17% of, of the cost pool that gets allocated um, to indirect costs. Um, and I highlighted in my agenda that, yes, this is a pretty significant increase. You know, it usually hovered around seven, maybe seven and a half million dollars in direct costs. But one of the things that the board can consider if, if uh, you know, we deem that this is just too much of, a, of an increase in expenses for, for admissions is to use a portion of the building sale proceeds to pay for the exam related expenses. Um, and the bill is SB40 that passed in, in October allows for that, allows for uh, the use of the net proceeds for um, to pay for the bar exam related expenses if, if need be. Um, so if that's something that the board wants to consider to reduce the indirect costs, we can certainly do that at mid-year, um, but just something I wanted to highlight for my agenda item. Now I wanna move into the reserves. Um, as a reminder, uh, the reserve policy that the board has set um, is for the funds to be between 17 and 30%, a floor of 17%, a ceiling of 13% of, of reserves. The ones that you see noted here as NA, those are those are exempt from um, the reserve policy. And those are really all of the grant related funds uh, and the client security fund. So those are not exempt. Uh, sorry, those are exempt from the 17 and 17% and, 17 and 30% policy. And the 17%, just as a reminder, equates to about two months, about two months worth of expenditures. Um, so first, as you see here, the general fund uh, in terms of reserves is expected to end 2023 uh, with close to $36 million, just over $36 million. And of course, that's mostly entirely due to the fact that we sold the San Francisco building. Uh, and we received about $30 million worth of net proceeds from that sale. So obviously that bumped up our reserve significantly and it's it's roughly around 36 million as of 2023. Now we do have a deficit spending of 22 million in uh, the general fund for 2024. So that leaves us at the end of 2024 with reserves of about just under 14 million. And in terms of that percentage level, that's almost 12%, which is still below the 17%. Um, Obviously, 2025, we definitely are, are seeking and need a fee increase. Uh, our 2025 forecast, just for example, for admit for the general fund is 24 million. So obviously, we don't have sufficient reserves to get through 2025. Now, in the admissions fund, um, they're doing a lot better than they had the past couple of years. They actually ended with a pretty uh, healthy reserve of about seven million dollars. 
Uh, they have a 2024 deficit spending of close to 3.8. So obviously they have sufficient reserves to get through 2024. Um, they are still below the 17%, um, but their forecast for at least 2025 um, is about 1.1 million, just over $1 million. So the reserves left as of, that we're projecting as of the end of 2024 will get them. It, it's anticipated that they will get through 2025 as well, but come 2026, uh, there won't be sufficient reserves in the admissions fund. Um, and admissions is still going through the process of uh, doing additional cost uh, cost cutting measures that'll be brought forth later on this year. Um, and I wanna quickly go back to the forecast, highlight the forecast uh, very briefly. So let me just go to page five. So I, as I mentioned, this is the first year that we had to do three years worth of forecast per the state auditor's recommendations. So these are some of the assumptions. These are the assumptions that, that we did on the revenue and, and or expense side. Um, so for the uh, for all of the non-personnel uh, expense categories, we are applying a 3% CPI increase. And that's based on the latest CPI that we obtained for the San Francisco Bay Area as of the end of December. Um, we do have a two and a half COLA um, uh, increase for only 2025. As I mentioned, there is no negotiated COLA for 26 or 27. So there is no COLA, um, there is no COLA factored into the personal cost for those years. Um, we have flat staffing levels compared to 2024. 2024 has, uh, I believe about five new positions, but in future years, we we remained, uh, we, re we budgeted or forecasted, I should say, for the same staffing levels. Obviously we didn't budget for uh, any uh, fee increase which is why you see the general fund forecast uh, deficit increasing uh, year over year. And then uh, on the revenue side, we did increase uh, mandatory fees by, by very little, it's only 0.3%. And again, that's uh, that's something that we're in the process of analyzing our, what is our future uh, licensee growth gonna be since it's at least in the general fund, the, the main driver of, of our revenue. So, you know, we're not seeing a lot of growth, but we do need to analyze and see um, if 3% is reasonable, maybe it should be higher. Uh, in prior years, we had seen a little bit over 1%, but it is an analysis we're doing. Um, and if if we need to make a recommendation to change the growth once we're done with our analysis, we will bring it back to the board um, and we can do that change at the mid-year, uh, when, when we do the mid-year budget adjustment. So I think that's all for the budget. I can go back and take questions that the board has. Mark. Thank you. So I'm looking at page 53 of the uh, budget report, 2024 budget report. You had a slide up earlier that I think was the same thing. And it's the one that looks at the general fund and it starts with the 2023 budget and ends with the 2027 forecast. Yeah. Okay. I believe it's this. So on this, help me understand what the um uh okay, so our cost. Well, let me just ask, tell me what building operations means. Building operation, uh, it, this is where our lease where our lease sits, our lease expense sits, as long as as well as any um our our security, any any supplies we have, okay. it's all building operations. But the biggest piece of this is our lease. Okay. Now, 2023 was the year that the building sold. Mm -hmm. So, um, what 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 I'm trying to get at looking at this is what's the difference in estimate? I don't need an exact number, but what's the range of the difference in our building operations? Uh, post sale versus pre sale. Total building operations, or just the cost of of either owning the building versus leasing the building. Well, I figure that because of the way you describe building operations, things like security, and there's a bunch of stuff that's going to remain whether we own or lease, mm -hmm. right? And so, 
Um, that's why I was just trying to say, is it a couple million you think around ballpark or more like um, I, probably Justin? Maybe if you can pull it up really quick. I know, I know. J Justin is the finance director, and he's I know he's watching this. Okay. Um, maybe I'm looking at the I numbers, say, I can't read underneath. Yeah, if if I can say maybe around a million, so we have to consider we still have LA, we still own LA, and all of the building operations right. in LA. It's is a hundred percent us. So if I say out of this, maybe a million would okay. be uh, building operations. It would be mostly LA. San Francisco should have a, a very small portion now that we do not own the building. Uh, Mark, if you want me, the building operations uh, budget in 2022, before we sold the building or did anything was 7.8 million. And you'll see the spike in 2024 is largely due to the lease. We occupy a much larger footprint in the San Francisco building than we will in 2025. And once we downsize that, it's going to save about $1.7 million, $1.8 million, because we will downsize our footprint in San Francisco. Okay. Thank you for the reminder. Um, all right. Th that was it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Justin. Uh, Patricia, I believe Patricia had her hand. Yeah. I had one question around the grant revenue. Mm -hmm. um, does the, the grant revenue sort of a pass through in and out, but do, is there indirect cost allocated to that? No, the grants are exempt from indirect cost allocation. Due to uh, statutory, uh, the, like, is there is there a rule the, on that? The, there is a little bit of indirect cost, but not the large grant revenue. We kind of exempt the grant revenue itself, but the personnel costs, that are associated with grant revenue, they do pay for things like HRIT finance and things of that nature, but it's much smaller than a percentage of their entire budget because most of their budget is grant revenue and that is exempt from the indirect cost model. And it's exempt because we we it's required to be exempt? It, it would really only impact the the way we model our finances because finances is, on, is uh how big your how large your budget is and that's how we kind of allocate the finance and it wouldn't be fair in our model to allocate finance because th there's so much more grant revenue hundreds of millions of dollars compared to the rest of the thing and i do believe although i'm not an expert in this that there are certain limits of uh personnel costs or administrative costs that are associated with grants that we have to abide by that we do abide by, but um, that's another consideration that we take with the indirect cost model and administering grants. Yeah, what I was going to offer, um, Patty, is that for most of our grants, there are caps on how much we can assess for any administrative costs, and we do maximize um, what we charge off to the grants um, uh, in accordance with those caps. I think that there is a little bit more flexibility with our main IOLTA funding, but I think it would be very politically challenging for us to all of a sudden start assessing an indirect cost allocation on the entire amount that is, um, um, you know, allocated out for uh, grantees. But that's something we could bring back at a future board meeting, just more information on what the specific uh, restrictions are for each of the grant sources that we uh, administer. Yeah, I mean, it's helpful to know you're maximizing and at the same time, um, other revenue is necessary into the future. And if if we could um, look at that, I think that um, it would it would be helpful. I don't think it solves the, the, the revenue challenge as a whole, but um, there may be other ways we can continue to maximize, I guess is where, where I'm going. Thank you. All right, Trustee Huser. Uh, just a couple of questions. Um, first of all, uh, can you remind me, is the equipment cost increase, is that essentially the upgrade to the IT systems? Uh, in the general fund, the equipment increase in 2024. Yes. Uh, I'm the, looking through 2027. So, yes, starting from 2024 through 2027, we have just a standard CPI uh, increase, but uh, a lot of the equipment uh, for IT does sit in the equipment uh, line. I don't know, Justin, if you have a little bit more uh, insight on that, but services and equipment is where IT heavily sits outside of personal, yeah, of I, But the increases to like 26 and 27 are purely the the 3% CPI increase that we're 
talking about or for unanticipated increase. Okay. And then for personnel costs, this assumes basically a flat headcount, but increases based on CPI and other um, factors that need to be included. Is that right? Or does this ant anticipate a larger headcount over the years? It anticipates anticipates a flat headcount, um, just other increases to healthcare, like healthcare increased significantly this year. And so we kind of have a CPI increase on healthcare and CalPERS and things of that nature. And then the, the merit increases, um, Mary, that we that we know are, are, you know, we look at every single employee and, and those who are, haven't reached their salary cap, uh, we do apply that merit increase. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, Trustee Sowell. Uh, Artaselli, thanks for uh, for the presentation. I, I have about uh, two or three questions. Um, my first one is, when with the discussion of the admissions fund and the uh, the deficit in the admissions fund, uh, there's a recommendation, or I'm not sure if it's a recommendation, but a suggestion that in, in the write up that the board might want to look at using the proceeds of the building to pay for that uh, that deficit. Um, so that would come out of the general fund that 11 percent plus reserve that we have there because that's not or that's not currently included in um uh that's not currently included in the the deficit projections for the general fund is that correct you mean the admissions the admissions piece correct no it's not we put all of the um all of the sale proceeds into the general fund so it right. would be, and it would it wouldn't be for the entire deficit. It would only be that portion of expenses that are bar exam related expenses. So, I mean, it is it is a big chunk of the admissions fund, but some some smaller portion of that could be paid with building proceeds. Um, just really, really to bring down the indirect cost increase, which is temporarily. It's just one year. If you see in, if you see in future years, maybe if I can show really quick. In future years, um, we did redo the indirect costs with their smaller footprint. And as you can see here, you know, their their forecast deficit does decrease. So really, this would just be a one time in 2024 um, that the board can consider doing so. Just so I'm clear, because so, um, um, I see a bunch of numbers here and I'm probably not looking at the right, right, uh, right place. Uh, how much would that be if we if, if we were to um, pay for that deficit out of the building proceeds? So Exam related expenses, we have 7.6 out of, uh, well, the deficit is 3.8, but yes. really the thought is here in the indirect cost, it went from about 7 point, and we don't true up. So one of the things that we no, historically do not do is true up indirect costs. Uh, we did do that uh, that exercise just to see how much indirect cost would have been if we did true it up. I um, mean, for admissions, they would have increased by about 600,000. So you know, the, the change is still about $2 million of indirect costs. So we could consider maybe those two paying $2 million uh, of indirect costs or to offset the increase of indirect costs from um, the exam related expenses. Got so it. that's a million. But so that's a suggestion. It's but a suggestion. As, I under, as I understand it, and as you, uh, I think, related, um, the admissions fund itself has enough of a reserve to cover this for now. Correct, and and as far as our forecast uh, goes, they are um, good until 2026. They have sufficient resources to get through uh, at least until 2026. Got it, got it. So, uh, okay, thank you for that. Uh, my next question has to do with um, the analysis that you're doing on license fee revenues. Uh, what did we use, because 0.3% is, uh, is a very sort of small percent in terms of the uh, the license fee, the number of I guess that's the number of licensees is that 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 are subject to the fee is that correct? The the growth in licensee uh, counts counts I should say. We derive our revenue by by uh, forecasting what our attorney counts are going to be, um, and then apply the fee. The correct. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's like so it's a would be a 0.3% increase in the number of licensees subject to the fee. Correct. All right. And his his story, I know you're doing this analysis right now, but do you know what we what we used last year? Um, Justin, you can correct me, but I think last year we did 
just over 1% growth um, in, in licensee, uh, licensee counts. Yeah, h historically in the last couple of years, it's been between one and one and a half percent. But the analysis that we're doing is looking at the total population uh, and the population is aging and there's a greater number of attorneys that are turning 70 and over 70 inactives do not pay any fees whatsoever. And so larger populations are turning older and therefore falling out of the population that is actually paying fees. And so that's the initial analysis showed that 0.3% was what we should be forecasting in the outer years, because it does not look like the number of attorneys attending law school and coming into the population would offset those that are leaving the profession. I understood what you just said. I, I think that this is probably a really pretty important conversation for us to have because I think it sort of feeds into um, probably the next item, which has to do with the reports that we have to submit to the to the legislature. And, and because that will, um, that's a discussion about what the, uh, the fee amount or the fee increase amount is that we should be asking for. And um, if it's subject to a smaller percentage growth in, licensees, that means that we'll probably be asking for a higher fee amount if the fee structure uh, it remains the same. Uh, and I know that there are, in that item, there's some discussion about possibly using uh, alternative fee structures uh, to uh, to get at, um, uh, you know, to, to uh, change the fee structure to get at the, uh, the, the licensee revenues. Um, when do you think you're going to have the analysis actually done? Um, on uh, that you're that you're currently undertaking, we should have it done already by the end of this week. What what I'm um, hoping the board will uh, consider doing is adopting the, this budget as it is. You're right that the 2025 projection is kind of integral to the next agenda item, the conversation about the fee increase request. I think that the board can. Um, direct that we use a modified projection for the fee increase request purpose, understanding that then we would need to come at the mid-year and through a budget adjustment align your adopted budget with the updated projection. But that way we can move forward today because this budget is due in two days um, and reworking all the numbers at this point would be quite challenging. Um, but know that we will have the conversation. We will resolve the licensee count issue this week, and then we can, if needed, come back to the board uh, and seek a budget amendment as appropriate. Very okay. Very good. I, I'm 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 good with that. Uh, definitely want to have continue this uh, continue having that discussion. Um, my last question has to do with just sort of all the other sort of. Uh, mandatory fees. And Mr. Tony was uh, in, in, in previous sort of settings and, and meetings that we've had, those, all those other fees are now uh, linked to a CPI. Is that, is that correct? So we've raised all the other fees uh, and which we've done, and now they're on a, a cyclical CPI increase, correct? Correct. Yes. And I, I believe you're talking about the general fund uh, program fees Well, in the general fund, the program fees. And, and, and obviously there's the admission uh, programs that we also raise. Yes, those are um, those are being raised or will be raised every year, uh, you know, per Mark's suggestion by the CPI. So the budget or forecast, I should say, does account for for that. All right. That's where I was going, just trying to make sure that that was um, in the forecast going forward. Yes. Okay. Yes, all of, all of the revenues are are also increasing, uh, and, and we are applying the CPI. Okay. And Artie, I just to clarify, <clears throat> there's one set of admissions fees that the board has not yet approved. This is on the admission side. Those are the fees associated with law school registration and accreditation. Those are going to be brought forward to you in March. Um, and we have not been able to fully implement all of the admissions fee increases because a couple of them are dependent on Supreme Court approval. So on the admission side, although all of these fees are reflected in the budget projections, we are at different stages of actually being able to implement all the fee increases. Good 
I'm good. I'm good with my line of questions. Thank you. All right. Any follow up questions based upon those topics? Any other comments or may I have a motion? Actually, thanks for putting that up, Louisa. So say I'll move the uh, budget. So any, I'll second it. All right, so first by Vice Chair Cisnero, second by Trustee Sowell. Louisa, can I have a roll call, please? Barahona. Aye. Buenaventura? Aye. Chen? Aye. Cisneros? Aye. Good? Aye. Huser? Aye. Shelby? Trustee Shelby? Aye. Thank you. Stevens? Aye. Soel? Aye. Tony? Aye. Trejo? I'm going to vote aye, but I have to recuse myself from the uh, the budget portions due to a personal non-financial interest. No. Yeah. Stallings? Aye. 12 ayes, zero nays, motion carries. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, uh, Ms. Montoya Chico. We are going to be moving on now to item 702, which is our April legislative reports. This is pursuant to Business and Professions Code 6086.20 and 6145.1. State Bar staff will be presenting on this. Leah, are you uh, leading off? Yeah, I'll lead us off. And um, maybe, Louisa, if you can put up the deck, and I'm going to get things started and provide all of you with an overview of how we hope to proceed. There's a lot of material. Uh, you could go forward to the next slide, Louisa. So- And then, then Leah, as far as questions, um, do you want trustees to ask as you go along or wait until, until the end? What works let best? Me, um, let me uh, speak to that in a minute, Brandon, okay. what, what I think would work best. So um, what we're hoping to do today is to give you an overview of each of the three reports, basically where we are. And there, there are three or two reports, depending on how you look at it. So this is going to be your first opportunity, for example, to get an update on the diversion report. It's also going to be your first opportunity um, to get an update on what we're calling the case processing standards report. This will be the second time you've had a fairly robust discussion about the fee increase request but today we have numbers for you on the portion of that request that we're calling expanding our impact. So one goal of today's conversation is just to make sure that you're all, you know, feel comfortable with where we're going with respect to each of these three deliverables. Um, I think uh, with respect to the diversion program, you're going to be asked to provide a George with some direction vis-a-vis -vis some options he's going to present to you. And then with respect to the fee increase request, we have teed up a number of decision points and, and policy issues, again, not for you to vote on today, but for you to give staff direction as we work towards finalizing the report. So just wanted to provide that overall frame. So fee increase request, we're gonna really spend the bulk of our time on that. Uh, as part of that, you're gonna hear about the case processing standards report and then there is the diversion report. We're actually going to start in somewhat reverse order. I'm going to turn things over to George now, and he's going to walk you through uh, the diversion report. The reason we're doing things in this order is the diversion report feeds into the related component of the fee increase request. So it's sort of foundational that you understand um, what we're putting forward as a uh, diversion programming. So with respect to comments I think it, and questions, I think it makes sense. Um, any questions and comments related to George's presentation, they're made at that time. And then when we get into the fee increase um, uh, deck, I, I think um, we could see how it goes, but it might make the most sense to take questions as they come up uh, for that portion. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn things over to George for diversion.
Louisa, can I share my screen so I can run the slide share? Um, I don't, I, Sure. Let me just send you this link, George. I, I mean, or or you could just tell me to advance and I can advance. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Are you ready for me to advance? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Great. So actually it wouldn't be that. It would be in the link, the, the link to the diversion program. Yeah, it's diversion. A separate... Yeah, so it may be easier if you just let me run the slideshow off of my sure. computer. I've got it on my computer. Sure, no problem. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes. Excellent. All right, so um, basically um, here's where we are. Um, this is the statute SB 40. Basically, as of January 1st, 2025, it does away with private approval, so there will no longer be any private discipline. And in conjunction with that, we were ordered to submit by April, 20, April 1st of 2024 some recommendations for the legislature to codify a formal disciplinary pr program. So at a previous meeting, we went over kind of where we are in terms of non-disciplinary outcomes and kind of diversionary approaches. So pre-complaint, we do referrals to mandatory fee arbitration where there are fee disputes in intake when a, when a complaint comes in. If it actually states a fee dispute, we can refer to mandatory fee arbitration. And if it's a request for a return of file or a request that the attorney start communicating, we can also effectively divert by giving a directional letter saying basically do this. And if you do, we'll get rid of the complaint. In investigation and charging, we can do the same things. And then we have other non-disciplinary resolutions, which are warning letters, which are basically, you know, look, we found substantial evidence that you might have done this, so please don't do it again. Admonition letters, essentially the same thing, or agreements in lieu of discipline, where we actually enter into an agreement with them to do certain things in return for which we won't proceed with a disciplinary action. Um, what we presented the last time was the addition of three additional diversion programs um, for fee arbitration, the addition of a mediation component um, uh, to resolve fee disputes, to try and get those out of the disciplinary system, more of those out of the disciplinary system and resolve them through mediation. Public trust liaison um, has proposed an attorney client bridge program, which is a pre-complaint. So before someone files a complaint, um, if they have these types of file return or communication issues and they don't feel like filing a complaint and going into the disciplinary system, this would offer them an opportunity to resolve those more informally. And the hope again is to resolve some of these things informally and take those, those minor violations out of the disciplinary system. And then we in the Office of Chief Trial Counsel effective last October, we began implementing a formal post-complaint diversion program. So after someone has filed a complaint and initiated the disciplinary process, a diversion program that takes minor violations by respondents who we believe don't pose a significant risk of harm out through effectively saying, we won't proceed with the disciplinary proceeding if you will do the following things. And those following things can be any number of things, um, you know, do alcohol treatment, do drug treatment, um, go to client trust accounting school, go to ethics school, um, refund this portion of fees, all those types of things or conditions we can set on the diversion. Our hope is, and from looking at a preliminary review of cases as we looked back over history, is that diversion ultimately, if fully implemented, could remove 10 to 20 percent of disciplinary complaints at an earlier stage in the system than they otherwise would, hence saving us resources to allow us to use those resources to focus on the more serious cases. So that's the ultimate goal. Um, it would result in a system like this where we would have basically pre-complaint um, diversion for fee disputes for file return and communication issues. Um, and then our post-complaint diversion either in the intake stage or in the investigation and charging stages of our matters. We've now put um, what we need on that, um, and you'll see the numbers when we get there, but basically um, the Office of Professional Support has looked at what they would need, um, including potential amendments to the rules for that, for the mandatory fee arbitration program and the, the amount of money that they're looking for will be incorporated in the fee increase slides. Public trust liaison, we've currently loaned them a staff member from OCTC to begin initial implementation of their program. 
but ultimately they've identified their staffing need as three investigators and one PTR, which is a call center um, person. Um, and again, those costs are in the fee increase slides. We've identified our needs at OCTC for full implementation. Um, uh, we're currently doing it with a part-time team consisting of two paralegals who we've assigned as part-time duty to do the monitoring. Ultimately, we would hope to have a team that would consist of one attorney, one investigator, and two paralegals. And again, the costs for that are in the fee increase slides. Um, so when we get to, so that's kind of the cost portion of diversion that will feed into the um, fee increase slides. The second part is the actual diversion report. And what the diversion report calls for is recommendations for codification. In other words, what are we going to recommend to the legislature as to what they should put in a statute to implement a diversion program? Um, and so I just wanted to give this example. Um, this is the rule out of Illinois. Co various jurisdictions have existing rules to govern diversion programs. There's also an ABA model rule. Most of them are similar in terms of their components, and that's all I'm trying to get you to look at here. There are typically a component that sets out eligibility requirements and typically sets a floor and says, these types of offenses will not be eligible for diversion. In other words, they're too serious to be eligible for diversion. Other rules have requirements that lay out um, what the diversion agreement should call for in terms of completion and or what should be other terms of the diversion agreement. Um, and then there's often a uh, statutory or rule-based language on what the effects of diversion are. In other words, what happens if you successfully complete diversion? What happens if you don't successfully complete diversion? So if you think about a rule or statute as having those three components, that'll then provide a basis for what we're here today seeking, which is some guidance um, from the board as to what you would be interested in in terms of recommendations. So for codification of a post-complaint diversion program, one option would be that they could simply pass a statute that says, implement a formal diversion program, and we're going to delegate to the board and OCTC authority to sort out those three components. That would be kind of the least restrictive statute that would give us the most flexibility as to how we set up that program. Option two would be to add to that direction some definition of baseline exclusions from eligibility. In other words, recommend to the legislature that they set a ceiling of types of offenses that are eligible for diversion. In other words, define those types of offenses that the legislature does not want to be part of the diversion program. But other than that, leave it up to the board and OCTC to define the eligibility criteria and the procedures we're going to use. Option three would be more direction from the legislature, defining what's excluded from eligibility, defining baseline requirements for procedures, and then above that, leaving discretion to us. So in terms of my thoughts, um, I don't think the legislature would be amenable to option one because it's basically just delegating everything to us. Um, in terms of Two and three, I think it's a choice for the board. Um, quite frankly, I could live with either as long as what was set were just baseline exclusions and baseline procedural requirements so that we would have flexibility outside those baselines to adjust both the eligibility criteria and the procedures um, as circumstances change, as we see different types of offenses being committed that we decide might warrant either inclusion or exclusion from diversion. Um, so that's basically the options on um, codifying a diversion program. The second thing to think about stems from the concern that when we do diversion, it's non-public. So one of the general purposes of discipline is a general deterrence function, which is attorneys see us imposing discipline on one attorney for one particular offense. And as a result, they get general deterrence and that they see that and decide, I don't want to engage in that type of conduct because I run the risk of discipline. With a diversionary program, we lose that impact because the diversion is non-public. So attorneys can't see what types of offenses are leading to non-disciplinary diversionary outcomes and so can't adjust their conduct to reflect the fact that we're actually taking action. Um, and that was recognized in this article. So again, in terms of kind of the transparency piece, 
um, do we want to propose modifications or a statutory authorization for disclosure of aggregate diversion information? And again, we can look at kind of three options. Option one would be nothing, in which case we would have to make decisions as to what we could disclose in accordance with existing statutes at the discretion of the board, bearing in mind that in general, um, under existing statutes, non-disciplinary outcomes are confidential. Option two would be for the legislature um, to authorize disclosure of aggregate information about the types of conduct receiving diversion. In other words, for example, in 2023, we imposed diversion on 200 attorneys who had failed to return files. It would be that type of aggregate reporting so that at least the type of conduct and the number of instances in which we granted, in which we went forward with diversion on that could be disclosed, but leave reporting to the discretion of the board as to when and how we would report it. And then option three is more legislative direction and control, authorized disclosure of the aggregate information, direct reporting through the ADR or otherwise, and then leave additional disclosure and reporting to the discretion of the board. So again, kind of three options. Um, which vary in terms of what is left to the discretion of the board and OCTC and what is directed by the legislature. Um, so that's basically where we are looking for guidance and preparing the report, which will be coming back to you in March as to which of these options um, the board prefers, thinks is better and or anything else. Um, so with that, uh, that's where we come to questions. Um, would you like me to stop sharing so that everybody can see everybody? You know, it might be helpful to have that first slide up, the first um, area where you need a direction, just to refresh our recollection sure. and, and drive the discussion. And then okay. on my screen, I'm, I can't see if someone has raised their hand. So I can. At least, um, okay. Uh, so George, if you could just go through who sure. is raising their hand. So I see a hand and the first hand I saw is trustee Huser. Thank you. Um, that was a great presentation. Just my first question was on the costs. You indicate some additional staff needed for these particular diversion programs, but yet there would be a expected 10 to 20% decrease in these cases that go longer and longer and longer. So presumably the net cost would be a savings over time. Is that correct? Am I thinking of that correctly? You are thinking of that correctly and you'll see that worked into the fee increase numbers. There's a note in the fee increase numbers indicating that the, so what the fee numbers are going to request overall is an overall increase in OCTC staffing to meet the case processing standards and reduce the backlog. Um, there's a note there that those numbers will have to be adjusted to account for the fact that if the diversion program is funded, we would hope to actually reduce the number of cases that proceed further through the disciplinary system. Right. And one of the reasons we want to do this diversion program is we just are, there's such a constant backlog on these cases, right? They're very difficult to get through. And so it actually expedites other cases, other more severe cases as well. Is that right? Um, so yes and no. So the types of cases that we divert, that the types of cases that we would be diverting are typically not the cases that take the longest period of time because they're more straightforward, simple cases in most instances. Um, but nevertheless, even a marginal decrease in the amount of resources we have to use for those cases frees those resources up to work on the longer, more complicated cases with the hope that that will decrease the time that those take. Yeah, and I think that's a really, really important point that bodes in favor of giving maximum discretion. So now I'll turn to this question, which you have up on the screen, which is the options one, two, and three. You said you didn't think there was any hope of getting option one, which I thought was a terrific option. Um, but, you know, because one of the things that I thought of is in even the most egregious types of cases, I mean, maybe not the absolute most egregious, but there's a big middle in there. You know, you want to have some discretion where, well, it falls into this category, but it would be perfect for a diversion kind of thing. So just my initial take on that is having more flexibility with professionals in the team, which would allow them not to say, well, this falls into this bucket, that falls into that, spend the time, you know, and all that. 
to me, option one um, carried a lot more um, uh, optionality there, which I think would be very effective. It means you have to trust the team. And so later on your second thing about the you know non non-public, I think having some kind of report out would be important, especially if you allowed more optionality in the front part. But I would advocate for allowing more optionality to the teams on the ground who are dealing with this and maybe have, if you have to have some baseline exclusions, that they be exceptionally narrow um, so that there is more judgment. And then going to the issue of you know general deterrence and non-public, to the extent you did any kind of a report out or that kind of thing um, in the aggregate, I think that takes care of that. It's not a general deterrence of people if we can't get through the most severe and medium severe instances either. So I would align with taking these kind of simpler ones and having them go through quickly to allow more resources to be spent on the more difficult ones. That's just my feedback. So the next question we had was from Trustee Buenaventura. Yes, uh, thank you, George. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is, um, when diversion is uh, gonna be imposed and the terms of the diversion um, are, are being given, is that something that is negotiated with respect to the terms or does OCTC basically said, say, this is what you have to do uh, to, to comply with diversion? Or is there a give and take between uh, the recipient of the diversion and OCTC in terms of negotiating what the proper programming should be? And then my second question is, and I just, I related back to my criminal experience. In, in the criminal cases, when diversion is granted, there's actually a record that diversion was granted. It doesn't really disclose what the terms are and things like that, but the fact that someone was placed on diversion, is that known to the general public? I understand if diversion is granted, then the case is closed and it's not filed, but is the fact that a person got diversion, is that known? Those are my questions, thanks. So I'll, I'll answer the second question first, which is um, in the disciplinary system, the fact that a particular attorney is granted diversion is not publicly known um, because it's in the stage of the investigation before disciplinary charges have been filed. And at that stage, everything relating to the complaint and the resolution is non-public under existing statute. Um, with respect to your second question, how we handle um, diversion agreements varies depending upon the stage. So right now we are offering diversion agreements in intake and that's before we've conducted a full investigation. And at that stage, we typically set the conditions and say, we're not gonna negotiate because at that point we haven't done an investigation of the facts. And so we're not in a position to really negotiate the conditions of diversion. And typically those are the simplest cases and the ones where the condition is essentially, you know, return a file, communicate with them, something that we can resolve in intake. When we move to investigation um, and we've done more investigation and we have a better understanding of what the facts actually are, if there's a dispute about them, um, then we typically will issue a diversion agreement with what we propose as the conditions. But in those instances, there can be some negotiation back and forth if they come back and say, look, you're saying this, but really it's this, and this condition doesn't make any sense. Yes, we can have that conversation. Does that answer? It does. Thank you, George. Um, and the next question I had was from Trustee Shelby. Melanie, can you uh, hear us? Hey, Melanie, uh, you're still on mute. All right. Oh, still um, on mute. Still can't hear you. Yeah. 
apologies for that. I, I, I'm on my phone. I don't have my laptop, so it's quite confusing. So. But I do have um, a question for you, George. As it relates to costs associated with each option, do the options have varying costs? I ask that because I know that, the, well, maybe let me ask that question first. Do the different options have different costs? I, I don't think the different options will have substantially different costs um, in terms of assuming that the baseline exclusions from eligibility are not overly uh, broad such that they unduly limit what we can do, they wouldn't vary the cost. In other words, the cost estimate that we've given for the post-complaint diversion is based on the assumption that ultimately we would get to something near that at least 10% of our, our cases. Um, and assuming that the eligibility criteria aren't set to make that much smaller, which I don't think they would be, then I don't think the cost estimates would vary. And th thank you. And then my other question is, as it relates to staff costs and fees, how do um, how will any of the options be implemented if the corresponding fee increase is not granted? If the corresponding fee increase is not granted, we would probably remain where we are with kind of our temporary part-time staffing for monitors. Um, there is a benefit to us of diversion. Um, so we would probably continue to administer the program as we are currently as a pilot and just continue that into the future. Okay, thank you. Well, George, I wanted to speak to some of the other components, not of the George right. administration. Yeah, no, that's right. Some of the others. So the fee increase request does include funding to support the expansion to uh, of MFA to include mandatory fee or to include mediation. If it's not funded by the fee increase request, then you know the board we would have to consider could we could we fund it. Um, so this is something that is pending getting the funding needed to uh, implement that expansion. And the Office of the Public Trust liaison um, with existing staff could try to implement some version of this program, but certainly it is not going to have the scale or impact from a diversion numbers perspective that it would if it was actually funded. So the next... Um... Trustee Shelby, does that? I think she said yes. Okay. Uh, so Trustee Tony and then Trustee Trejo. Thank you. Thank you very much for this presentation, George. It's uh, I like the clarity of the questions that you put in front of us and the options. Um, what, if we can take a step back, tell me what the difference is. This says direct establishment of a diversion program, but then I thought I also heard you say we kind of already have one. What's the difference between what this is and what we have now? Just briefly, please. So um, we basically on our own put in place a diversion program, um, basically seeing that the legislature, seeing the writing on the wall, that this was something that interested the legislature and also seeing that it was something that could um, benefit our handling of cases and hopefully, um, if it's in place, speed up our case processing um, times and decrease the backlog. So we put it in place voluntarily right. um, before the legislature or while the legislature was still considering SB 40 and the uh, kind of reports and direction. Right. So directing the establishment would simply be that there would now be a statute on the books, basically from the legislature giving direction that they are directing us to maintain the formal diversion program. Got it. So it's almost like a formalization of the diversion program. In Correct. Some... Okay. That's cool. Um, so um, I, a couple of comments. I'm, um, I like option number two. Um, what I would like to see is that the, and maybe this is in, in preparation for, for March uh, meeting, I think the board should um, recommend what we think the baseline exclusions are um, and, um, and what the list are, what the parameters are and not just leave it completely open to 
the legislature, I think that we should come up. And so I'd love to see your recommendations um, at that point or whenever you feel is appropriate to share with us in advance of, of the March meeting. But so that's a recommendation um, I have. I, I will say that this confidentiality is an interesting thing. Um, you know, I, I do not, I, I, I am not of the opinion that um, releasing aggregate reports is a violation of confidentiality. Um, you know, you can take confidentiality to the extreme and say, well, it's so confidential, we can't even say we got the program. Okay, the program doesn't exist, or we can't talk about it because it's confidential. I really think confidentiality is a feature of individuals, and not that you have a program and that you can't report how many people were in it. Because one of the questions that may come, for instance, is, well, how many people currently uh, uh, um, ha have been referred to diversion? And what's your goal if we get the funding? I think we have to be able to answer that. You know, our goal would be X number to go into diversion. And then they'll, they're going to want to report, you know, okay, your goal was this. And th the year after, how close did you come to the goal? How's it going? Is it worth the money? So I, 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 I don't really think that you violate confidentiality by just being able to say very broad strokes. So those are my thoughts. Uh, agree with that. And, and we've never taken the position that aggregate data is um, something that the confidentialized statutes apply to. Indeed, we report a, a volume of aggregate data in the ADR and, and other places on our website elsewhere. Um, it would be basically just giving this, including in, a, in the proposal for the statute, a specific direction that we report that type of aggregate data. So, uh, trustee, you. oh, and uh, it is my expectation uh, if the general direction is that it's either option one or two, we would come back in March with suggestions for what should be proposed for the baseline parameters for option two. Great. Thank you. Um, trustee Trejo. Um, yeah, George, I switched my settings so I can now see. So I'll kind uh, of take that back over. Um, I will uh, just absolutely. say. Absolutely. If there's, you know, if there's any questions specifically to, um, you know, this guidance, the guidance that George needs on this specific point, let's do that. Um, and if I could also get an indication just from the trustee on which way they're leaning so we can kind of see if we're looking at one, two, or three, and then kind of direct discussion that way. So, uh, Trustee Trejo. Thanks. Uh, and, and sorry, I just... Um... One of the disadvantages of speaking this late on is that I feel like a lot of points have already been made, but I just want to, one of the things that I do want to address, um, I think this is a great idea. I think that this would be a way to hopefully offset some of the, 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 the backlog. But I do think that um, how you roll it out, right? And how you think about how this is instituted over a period of time is important which now goes into the idea of baselines and requirements and these types of things. Um, I just want to make sure that, you know, we, that, that if we do go this way, that we set it up for success and make sure that we also are able to see the impact that it has on alleviating our current backlog and assuring hopefully that the creation of this new, new this diversion component doesn't create a backlog within the diversion component. Right. So I think that how we that once we, we once we have agreed to what this product is going to look like, how we roll it out and how we measure our success is going to be critically important. And, and, and I'm for the idea of creating these baselines and requirements to to allow that to happen. So that's that's just my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Sowell. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, right. Right off the bat, I, I think I'm leaning towards option two um, uh, to respond to uh, to your direction, Brandon. Um, George, a couple of, of questions for you. Um, in your response to Mr. Tony, you indicated that we do have uh, a, a pilot diversion program right now. Um, can you compare that program in terms of its staffing to what it is that you're proposing 
uh, right now because there could be some, I don't know, uh, some retort that well you're doing you're doing this now, uh, so why do you need additional sort of team members to uh, to execute? Yeah, so so right now the only staff that we have designated as assigned to the diversion program is two paralegals. We're doing this part time as an extra duty over and above their normal duties to basically serve as monitors. Um, the rest of the program, we don't have anybody specifically assigned. In other words, we've set up um, criteria and other things, but we don't have, for an example, either an attorney or an investigator who is assigned full time to work with the program, make sure that everything is being um, done in accordance, do the tracking, the monitoring, oversee that, engage in the types of negotiations that were thought of and oversee those and try and maintain consistency across the program. To the extent we're doing that, we're doing that with um, kind of, again, part-time assignments from people who are already doing all kinds of other things. Um, so that's basically the main difference. Um, the staffing that we're asked for, the two paralegals, the one investigator and the attorney would be assigned basically to work diversion full-time in the hopes of speeding the process, avoiding what um, Trustee Trejo has, has referenced, avoiding diversion cases themselves getting delayed or unduly uh, backlogged. Um, so that's the difference. Very good. Um, and we have we talked to the legislature, George, you uh, in, in uh, I think your presentation, you indicated that uh, some of the, the piloting of this was in, an, in, in anticipation that the legislature was actually looking for would be looking for something like this. And have we had any discussion with them um, as it relates to the, the results of, uh, of how things have worked thus far? Um, we haven't, but that'll be included in, in the March report. We do have some limited data as to how the diversion, some limited statistical data about the diversion program. Um, we haven't had it running for long enough to kind of track outcomes um, or things like that, but we do have numbers on the types of cases and the numbers of cases that we've put through the diversion program. Got it. And so all the formalization that you're talking about in terms of the establishment, that would just all be done via the fee bill, correct? The formalization of the program would be through this diversion report, which is a separate report that the legislature asked for, and it would be recommendations to the legislature, and the legislature would then, at some point, depending on their reaction to the recommendations, presumably propose and implement a statute that would then formalize the program. Got it. Okay. I'm good. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I see someone over in uh, San Francisco. Yes. Um, hi. Um, so I just wanted to say I echo uh, Trustee Huser's comments about option one being kind of the most desirable in terms of there being um, tons of flexibility um, to OCTC and to us to consider individual facts and, and circumstances. But recognizing that that's a non-starter, you know, I support option two. And to Mr. Tony's uh, point, I had the same question. And so that was answered appropriately that George, you and your office are coming up with proposals around what the baseline exclusions from eligibility should be. So for me, option two, I think is the clear winner here. And also on the second part as well, I support um, reporting out in an aggregate fashion what the diversion program is dealing with for two reasons. One is maybe there's some deterrent value, uh, but two is just sort of increased transparency, which is what the bar is all about. And so I, I favor that um, as well. So thank you. All right, thank you, Trustee Good. George, I just had a, a question about the difference between option two and option three. And I know sometimes in the practice of law, if we have certain rules codified, uh, then it helps um, you know, down the line as far as the prosecutor who's reviewing whether or not um, you know, proper procedures are, you know, have been filed, whether, um, you know, we have those baseline requirements that we can now then take and fairly and equitably um, apply to whatever cases is at hand. 
would you like to have more direction um, if we went with option three? And do you think that would kind of got aid in um, us being able to adhere to some of these larger, you know, equ you know, fairness and equity type principles we've talked about, especially with the Farkas uh, study, um, or would it be more of a hindrance? Um, I mean, my my preference would be for option two um, as opposed to option three. I think the board and OCTC can um, work with um, procedures to come up with procedures that are are fair and equitable. Um, and in part, it gives us then the flexibility to respond as appropriate if, in fact, we see something like the Farkas report that suggests we should change procedures or do something with the procedures. So my preference would be I, I don't think there's a problem with setting baseline exclusions from eligibility, and I can easily come up with some recommendations as to what those are. My personal preference would be to leave the procedures more flexible so that we have the uh, ability to adjust those as things like staffing, types of offenses, other things change so that we have the flexibility to keep the diversion program moving as all of those things may change in the future. Okay, great, thank you. All right, so just kind of a taking a temperature of the room, it seems like option two has us a significant majority, or at least a, it seems like there's a majority that supports option two. Uh, does anybody wish to be heard either as to option one or option three? Or is there being consensus option two is how we'd like to proceed? Okay. My preference I will take is that as my guidance in preparing yeah. the draft report for March. Got it. All right. And then down to the reporting out. Um, again, it looked like um, option two seems to be the preference. Anybody have any strong feelings one way or the other about option one or option three? I correct me if I'm wrong. Again, if option two is not what the preference is, speak now. Okay, it looks like option, oh, sorry, Trustee Tony. Oh, you're on mute there. But you're still on mute. Okay. All right. There you go. Um, for now, I just reserve the right to think about this more. Okay, that's all I'm saying. For now, okay, but please, it, it's still still new to me. I'm still learning it. So yep. for now, I'm good. But I reserve the right to like keep thinking about it. <laughs> Absolutely, I think that's what uh, everybody will continue to do until we receive our final report. All right, George, is that the guidance that, you need then on these two that items? Is, that is the guidance I need. I'm going to stop sharing and return it back to Louisa. All right, perfect. I would recommend that we uh, take a short bio break. If, I, if we bring everybody back at 1140, does that work for everybody? Trustee Barahona have, have their hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. Trustee I'm Barahona. So sorry. Yeah, Chair Stallings, apologies. Um, just really quickly, if there is a net cost um, savings over time, I assume, George, that will be made explicit. And my question is, um, will that detract in any way from the fee increase? Your, so, your team us up perfectly for our next conversation. So okay. <laughs> Forget you want me to hold it? To yeah, I think that will be addressed as we discuss what we're proposing in terms of OCTC staffing increases as part of the fee increase. Okay, thank you. All right, great question. Let's uh, put a pin in that. We'll come back at 1140 uh, for the next uh, series of reports. So you get to see you guys in about eight minutes.
I agree with that. Because we're going to take a role model. All right, looks like we have a couple of trustees still filtering in. Looks like we have close to everybody here. So, Louisa, are we recording? Yes, we are. All right. All right, call the meeting back to order. And if we could go on to our next uh, portion of this agenda item, please. Sure, Louisa, can you put up the uh, with me? So we are gonna move into the fee increase request discussion. And as a subcomponent of that, we will give you an overview of the case processing standards report. I am gonna turn things over to Araceli to walk you through sustaining core operations. That's the first of two components of the fee increase request. Basically, what do we need to just keep the lights on? And Araceli in her presentation is really just going to focus on what's changed since you've last seen that. And then I will take over and go, um, go over the expanding impact areas. So Louisa, you can advance the slide and Araceli take it away. Sure. Thanks, Leah. Um, so, so I'm just going to, I hear an echo now. Um, I'm just going to go through the next uh, few slides really quickly, just kind of as a reminder of, of the different fee increase requests we've discussed over time. So in June 2023, uh, we came up with a 77 for active uh, licensee fee increased. Um, you can move to the next one, um, Louisa. And then in August, we came back and discussed, and this is actually what we presented to the legislature, and we, what we shared with them was an $82 um, per active licensee fee increase. Uh, hopefully we, everyone recalls we, we had discussions over, and then keep going, Louisa. Um, and then this this slide was literally what I presented in a, the January board meeting, kind of where we were with the adjusted budget and where we were going to be with the projection. So at that point in time, the fee had been increased to $103 uh, from the 77 in June and then the 82 in August. Um, and then one more, Lisa, please. And then this is where we are today. So as of today, um, our fee increase actually has changed to $114 just for core operations um, based on the 2025 budget. So I just wanted to highlight really quick, um, obviously the 2025 forecast is based off of our 2024 budget. Um, the adjusted budget column that you see here, it's very similar to what it was in January, except that um, the deficit is slightly smaller. Um, and then our 2025 projections, which I, the biggest driver of the change really is the change in licensee counts that I highlighted in my presentation. Um, our revenue really is not increasing based on those, uh, not increasing significantly um, based on those change in attorney counts. Um, and also in 2025, we lose the, um, the special, the $5 special IT assessment fee. So our revenue really stays almost consistent from 2024 um, and the expenses obviously continue going up. So now our deficit, which used to be 22 uh, when I presented it in January is now 24. Um, so that drives the $114 um, for active licensee increase fee we need just for core operations. And I'm just going to um, explain quickly our um, mm -hmm. uh, Office of Research and Statistics generates our licensee projections that we use and they give three different uh, scenarios that we can choose from. In um, developing the 2025 budget and pro projection that you saw today, we used the most conservative number, and that was a change from what was included uh, in the draft budget that was presented to you in January. Um, and so it turned out the number that was used in January was too aggressive. It was kind of an error on, on our part. But now we've picked a very conservative number. So as we've uh, talked about in the, in the previous item, there's more work to do to pick the land in the right place on this issue because um, I'm not convinced that 
and using the most conservative number is appropriate, right? Because we don't want to have folks call into question, um, you know, the number that we're using to base our 2025 revenue projection on. But that is why we've gone from 130 in January to 114 today. Any questions on that piece before I move into expanding growth? Expanding our impact. No? Yes, trustee so well. Leah, one of the things, um, and, I, and maybe it's the next slide, sustaining core operations. Oh, um, yes, I'm sorry. Lou, um, I, I'm jumping ahead. Arcelli, why don't you go to the next one? I skipped, sorry. <laughs> yes. So this, um, this is $114 uh, broken out by, for a core operation, uh, car operating needs uh, broken down by the same components that we have presented previously and that we presented with the legislature. Um, so these are the four categories, if you will, or the four, the four buckets that we've kind of put the $114 fee increase to. Um, okay. And if you see, it's primarily to um, address the contractual obligations for our personnel costs. Um, obviously, compared to June 2023 and even August 2023, 2025 is almost two years more worth of uh, get in projections. So yes, our personal costs are increasing and as such this number uh, increased to $39 of the total 114. Um, the lease component, uh, it kind of went back to what it was in 2020, sorry, what it was in June, 2021. Uh, so now we, that we sold the building, we're, we're incurring the cost of leasing it. Um, and that went back up to $21. Um, and then the PTO and sick leave accruals, we had historically not budgeted um, them, but now that we really have depleting reserves in the general fund, um, those are expenses that are always, we were always booking them just at year end. So that's when the expense hit. Now we're budgeting them so that they're in line. And, and when you see your budget to actuals, the, the expenses there, it's something that the state bar is absolutely 100% on the hook for. So there's the $14 increase, which obviously goes up as their personal costs go up. And then really the $40, which is pretty significant, as you can see, is the structural deficit portion. Um, we started in June with the $24, which is what the state auditor recommended um, when they said we needed a fee increase and they recommended $24. Well, obviously our deficit has increased and now we're at $40. Um, and so those are the kind of the four components that makes up our 114 and we wanted to keep them aligned with what we had shared with the legislature in August. Leo? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, does that answer your, your question? It or does. Although if, if if you and RSL could just talk a little bit more about the uh, the contractual obligations that first that first jump from 27 to 39 and I I, I note that you even have the 39 you know in a box there so highlighted but if you could just talk just to maybe just talk me through just a little bit more maybe that that first one I know you just went over it but just one more time that first one and the second one again sure um, so the the what we did is the um, the contractual obligations is our personal costs. You know, what it costs to fund our personal costs. And uh, the number from June 2026, uh, sorry, from June 2023, um, we had brought uh, this discussion to the board saying, hey, you know, our vacancy rate has, we had budgeted 2023 with a vacancy rate of 15%, uh, but our actuals through all of 2023, now that it's over, was hovering really more around 8%. So that initial uh, twenty six dollars, and really in August it was only a dollar more, was to reduce the vacancy rate to actual, uh, not use the fifteen percent, but use the eight percent, as well as get rid of our hiring freeze. Uh, so to account for that, you know, that increase in expenditures, that this is where this bucket comes from. What I've done I've in done 20, for twenty twenty five is we've taken the same the same your know, personal cost, what it was in August of twenty twenty three, what it's going to be in. Uh, by 2025, and that growth is the $39, right? Or personal expenses as I uh, presented in my budget are only going up with the merit increases, the increase in healthcare rates. Uh, we're continuing to make the assumption that it's around 8%. Um, so it's really just the, the growth in our personal costs that's driving the change in the fees for this component. Um, I just want to emphasize how sensitive these numbers are. So you saw we went from 103 to 114. And that was really based on a $2 million change in the revenue projection. So $2 million translates to an $11 
change in the per licensee fee assessment. So here, even though it looks like a very big jump from 27 to 39, you're talking about no more than a $3 million change. And remember that every year pursuant to our contractual obligations, all staff, union staff that are not at the top of their range are guaranteed to get their 5% step increase. So just that alone helps you understand how this is just continues to escalate. And although the number looks big, we're not actually talking about that many millions of, of, of dollars here uh, that it's accounting for. I wonder, uh, Louisa and Leah, if it would be um, uh, just for display purposes, if it would also just be helpful to show what the number would be in 2024. So it, there's a so you're, it doesn't look like it's that huge of a jump. Okay, certainly when we uh, we can take that direction for preparation of the report itself. Yeah, I would. I, I might do that for yeah, just this page. In, in, in general, uh, mm -hmm. for those line items. Trustee Tony. Thank you. Um, if we were to get the 114, um, I know that's one of the only one of the options that's being uh, presented and discussed today. Um, would we, would that number allow us to retain the current um, balance we have, or does it deplete the balance? You mean the reserve balance? Yes, please. That's what I meant. We would retain it. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Um, I, I'm going to make a suggestion, and this is a suggestion that's based upon the conversation we had at the trustee meeting in January, and it's based upon the comments of trustee Huser and trustee Trejo, um, who indicated that um, when you're running a deficit, um, you also need to look at cost cutting. And I I um I would think that for the 2025, it's worth showing what the consequences are or the scenarios are if there is no rate increase. And not that that's a proposal, but it's more of a consequence. So if there's no rate increase, here are the um, scenarios. If we went full steam and didn't cut any personnel, we'd run out of money in October of the year. And then nobody would be being paid salaries. Or we can, um, you know, or we would in January of 2025, in order to run a budget, this is how many staff would need to be laid off because that would be the consequence. This is not threatening to do something, but this is letting legislators know what the consequences of their votes mean. I think that's, I think that's uh, justifiable. And I would encourage even something that was as detailed as this many from this department, this many from this department, this many from this department, to really give the legislators a visceral sense of what happens and what will happen if um, there is no fee increase. Those are my thoughts. I think that should be part of the April report. Great. Trustee Shelby. Looks like nope, not able to take it off off mute. Okay, well, we'll we'll come back to you. Um, any other? 
questions or comments up to this point? Oh, I think we might have tr Trustee Shelby now. Yes, I um I like that. I'm sorry I missed the first part of the conversation, but I do like the inclusion of 2024. Um, and I actually like the language. You know, Trustee Tony said consequence. I just think reality is important, right? I mean, when we are talking about the things that we have done, and the and I, and I know that the team has been very focused in terms of educating. And as a I should say, as a legislative liaison, I am well aware of the education that has transpired. And we know that there is um, an appetite in the assembly as they run point this year as it relates to a fee increase. But I think the the reality of what will need to trans transpire, I think we have in the past really just done what we've needed to do, but it's understanding the, the significant budget deficit in the state of California I think we also have to articulate for the legislative body exactly what it means to not continue to be fully funded in the way that we need to be funded. And so I guess that was more of a comment rather than a question. No, it's our points well taken. In fact, um, you know, the structure of the reports as outlined in the statute the, they, we are directly asked to talk about consequences and really to talk about um, the funding request in an incremental way to say, you know, if we didn't get this amount, this would happen. If we didn't get this, this would happen. So definitely, um, again, I hear what you're saying. We, we will do that. At this point, we've been very focused on trying to finalize the numbers and then we will move to messaging and framing. And then my question was around um, what George presented as it related to the diversion. What does that reflect? And maybe I missed that because I'm, you know, I, I, I am structurally challenged today. But what does that reflect in terms of the legislative, uh, the fee increase, particularly as it relates to how to implement? I guess what I'm trying to figure out is with the diversion piece. My questions earlier were what were the costs associated with each option? And then we learned that there was a pilot program um, that was currently underway. And then my follow-up question to that was around how to implement if the corresponding fee increase was not granted. So I guess this follow-up to that is what in fact is the corresponding fee increase as it relates to the diversion program as we've identified that option two is that on both pieces, is what the board is feeling the most comfortable with. The next um, set of slides we're gonna go through is the expanding impact section of the fee increase request, and that's where you're gonna see diversion. And I'll be able to okay. respond to that then. Okay, so diver just from a clarification standpoint, diversion is not included in this 114 that sits in front of us. No, this is just like contractual obligations, healthcare costs, the lease, this PTO sick leave accrual, just kind of the standard operating way that we're doing business now, not adding or expanding new programming. Okay, thank you. Right, uh, Trustee Huser. What are the headcount increases anticipated in this 2025 number? There's no headcount um, in 2025. We had a headcount increase in 2024, I believe of four FTEs in your 2024 budget. And growing at, beyond that, there's no headcount increase. Well, but does that include not filling the vacant spots? This, this reflects a vacancy rate of, I believe, 7.5% or RSLA or 8%. <laughs> Um, so we do have a vacancy rate built in. It doesn't assume all of our positions are filled, but it's not as high as we budgeted for 2023, a 15% vacancy rate. Thank you. Trustee Sewell. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I think I'm going to hold my question because I think it, it, uh, um, it, it would be better served after Leah goes through the expanding uh, sort of cooperations part of this. 
Okay, sounds good. Any questions up to this point on what we've talked about, keeping in mind that we do have significant other slides to talk about um, just as far as expanding operations, et cetera. Anything else? All right, I think we can go on to the next. All right, so Louisa, if you could advance it. So expanding impact. Um, we have one sort of historical reference point here, as opposed to two with uh, core operate, sustaining core operations. In June of 2023, we, I, we identified an expanding impact funding need of $30 per active licensee. So just a reference point for you. Now you can go forward. In January, we presented a number of areas for uh, potential inclusion in this component of the fee increase request. And now what we've done is we've costed them out and we've begun to do a little bit of this framing um, that we were just talking about needing to do uh, with reference to sustaining cooperations. So here, the attorney representation pilot, again, as a reminder, this would fund one of the key uh, recommendations that came out of the Robertson report, the analysis of things the state bar could do to mitigate racial disparities in the attorney discipline system. This pilot would fund appointed counsel for a relatively small number of respondents. So you see, we've costed that out a dollar 25 per active licensee and this would be a one-time funding request as a pilot all kinds of discussion to be have to be had about viability and sustainability but as it's structured now one time we can move forward the complaint review unit uh this is uh aline i think you're going to cover this slide quickly. yes yeah good morning everybody i'll try to be quick um, you know, $3.25 per active licensee or around $682,000 is being requested to adequately um, staff the complaint review unit. For those of you that may not have familiarity with the program, complaint review unit currently resides with Office of General Counsel. It functions, it functions as an independent second look of the complaints that are closed by Office of Chief Trial Counsel. In other words, if a complaint is filed with OCTC that's later closed, that complaining witness has an opportunity to request a second look into that complaint. Um, the, currently, there is no sufficient resources and staffing for crew to function effectively and without inc increasing the backlog. In the last five years, crew met 100% uh, of its clearance rate only four times. Um, we have um, we we receive about 367 new requests per per quarter monthly. You know, in month, monthly volume is about 122 requests, and we do not have the current staffing to even meet the 100% uh, clearance rate. As a result, our backlog has increased over 1,200,000 requests as of now. We also are um, not doing so great with respect to the disposition time. Uh, right now, our requests are running on average of 10 to 11 months. And so the requested funding is really to stabilize that program, ensure that we have 100% clearance rate of the requests that are coming through, and to improve overall disposition time. Uh, we also foresee that some impact could be made to the backlog of cases. However, additional one-time funding funding is necessary for the backlog reduction. We are doing some analysis right now to determine what that amount may be and, and, and provide a pr proposal to address that backlog. Um, unless um, board has any questions. Um, at the end of the presentation, you will see our most recent um, crew dashboard presentation, which includes the numbers that I quickly went over during our presentation right now. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna Doesn't look like there's questions. any questions, so let's keep going. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So that's Louisa. So the client trust. I, I have one quick question. Yes. Is it? It was that an amount over and above the one fourteen, or included in yes. the one fourteen? No. All of this we're talking about is over and above. And at the Thank end you. of this section, there's a a couple of spreadsheets that are going to help put this all together because I know it's confusing. 
So this is the Client Trust Account Protection Program. You all know that absent any new resources, we did implement what I would call phase one of the program. Uh, this was one of the key initiatives that the board uh, launched really in response to the Girardi uh, situation is to require all attorneys in the state to register their client trust accounts and to affirm compliance with various uh, related rules of professional conduct. This requested funding here would allow us to expand the program to reflect its original intended design, which was to include not just registration of trust accounts, but also compliance reviews and a smaller number of regulatory audits. So the cost of this program, if levied on all licensees, is $8.75. You see here a reference in the slide to the cost per licensee. If it was only levied on those with client trust accounts, which we estimated a little over um, half of active licensees, I believe, um, but that cost would be $17.75 uh, per licensee if only levied on those with client trust accounts. So this is the client trust account uh, protection program. Diversion, George. So this is the estimated cost of all three prongs of the diversion program that I talked about. So the one component that's the fee arbitration improvements, um, including a mediation program. Um, the second of which is the pre-complaint diversion in the Office of Public Trust Liaison. And the third of which is the um, post-complaint diversion in OCTC. And you can see the cost there, um, 1.3 million of which 420,000 is for a limited term three years. I believe, and Leah, correct me, but I believe that's the fee arbitration piece. That's correct. Um, or 650 per active licensee for three years and 450 thereafter. So the piece thereafter would be the extra staffing for um, the Office of Public Trust Liaison and OCTC um, and the small component. Um, Obviously, I've already talked about what the funding would be for and what it's supposed to do. Um, if we don't get the funding, we'll continue to use our existing resources to staff our kind of pilot diversion program, but that will limit its reach. Um, the other two programs wouldn't be able to meaningfully launch or expand, and so the overall numbers of cases diverted would be reduced, um, which would limit the intended effect, which is to take those cases out and allow us to focus on more serious disciplinary matters. And just to um, say a little bit about the one-time funding for mandatory fee arbitration, the mediation <laughs> model that's being looked at is one in place in the Los Angeles Superior Court. There's small claims uh, division, which uses um, a combination of uh, an online platform and a mediation firm to run mediation for you know tens of thousands of small claims matters each year very good customer feedback and also uh, feedback from the court itself about this program. So that is the one uh, time cost is sort of getting that infrastructure up in place and mandatory fee arb. That particular aspect of this request does not include additional state bar staffing. So that's a cost here. We'll go on to elimination of bias. This, um, this is something that uh, we do want to discuss with you either now or when we move into the uh, discussion portion of this um, of this item. Elimination of bias is currently a voluntary fee. We are requesting that the voluntary fee of two dollars be made mandatory. Currently, about seventy percent of licensees pay this fee. So to construe this as a fee increase of two dollars is inaccurate and perhaps unhelpful to us uh, because it is a conversion of a voluntary fee to a mandatory one. That would result in about $144,000 additional per year. That's the delta that we're looking for. And this would fund a host of our elimination of bias and DEI related work. And those of you that have been on the board know for a while know that every other year we are required statutorily to report on our work and our progress on achieving various elimination of bias related goals. This would provide us with a stable and secure funding source to achieve that result. Um, but it is a slightly different posture here because it is not a new fee. 
uh, it's a conversion from voluntary to mandatory. Next one, IT. Steve, this is a new uh, one you've not yet seen, and you're going to hear some numbers now and yes. don't fall off your chairs. Yeah, there, um, there's no number here. I apologize. We just got these numbers finalized on Friday. Um, so the amount needed for IT is estimated at about $16.6 million, which equates to $79.25 um, active fee. But uh, a portion of that is ongoing and a portion of that is only uh, one time. The ongoing component is about $3.6 million uh, or $17.25 uh, active fee. And that would include uh, a significant expansion in the number of IT uh, positions um, going up uh, from about 44 to 64, uh, so 20 new FTE and ongoing licensing and maintenance for several new systems that we're proposing. The remainder, $13 million or about $62 active uh, fee um, is for uh, special projects and system design and implementations. The vast uh, majority of that would be for a new attorney information regulation system. Uh, that is the main system that we use to manage all licensee records. Uh, we had intended to do this upgrade a few years ago, but the cost far exceeded uh, the original estimate. So we have made several improvements around the margins of related systems in the meantime, uh, but the time really has come to move forward with a, a major system uh, upgrade. This is still a kind of a green screen uh, system and um, it really hampers us to not have uh, an updated, more modern version. So in terms of how we got these numbers, we've been working with an IT consulting firm over the past several months, uh, doing a real deep dive a review of the IT organization, um, looking at organizational structure, systems and processes, uh, staffing and uh, technology. So the costs presented here reflect this firm's recommendations for what we need uh, to do in all of these areas to have the IT organization that supports the bar's uh, mission going forward. I think we really are in this, I think, agreement uh, throughout the bar that we are at an inflection point now with IT, with almost everything that the bar is currently doing or wants to do in the future, uh, dependent uh, directly or indirectly on modern IT systems. If we fall behind in technology, it is going to significantly hamper our existing core mission critical activities and new initiatives. Uh, one note, we just got these numbers, as I said, on Friday. They are being now reviewed by an independent third-party expert who has many, many years of IT consulting and project management experience for state of California uh, government agencies. We've also asked the California Department of Technology to review. They are going to let us know if they have the resources to do this on our uh, very compressed uh, time frame. But uh, it is all being looked at uh, now, so it is it may change uh, a little bit um, as we prepare for the final reports uh, in April. Trustee Tony. Thank you. Um, I'll tell you what I think would be helpful to making the case here. Right now, under why do we need additional money and what the impact will be, the sentence that describes seems to be why we need more money. What's missing is what's the positive impact of this? Maybe you, you can make that a separate bullet point and really help people understand what this will give us that we don't have now. I think that's important to, to be really clear about that. I actually don't see it in here. Good feedback, thank you. All right, Trustee Huser. I have to be honest, I feel a little bit like we're boiling the frog here and that we're not seeing the full picture. Um, you know, we just approved a, a big budget and then we were looking at the 114 and now we're looking at all these incremental pieces and then we were looking at how to structure the B increases among different groups and I'm I'm struggling to see the full picture in one place and I'm creating charts for myself and that kind of thing. But I think it would be useful um, to have, I don't know if you have it already, just in one place, you know, what is everything that we're asking for so we can see what that looks like to the people who we're asking to pay these fee increases, because I assume that's how we're paying for this. So um, it, it's getting high in my mind and, and I'm struggling to see the whole picture. So Louisa, maybe you can just scroll forward um, to the table. No, yeah. 
So <laughs> the expanding impact table um, here, so we haven't gone through all of these, but just if this is helpful, so you can see that without IT, which has a TBD there, we are at 49.50 per active licensee for 2025, 67 um, 2026, and 85.75, $85.75 2027. And there's some notes here about what's one time, what's being split over th over three years, and is one time and what is being split over multiple years, but is cumulative in nature, and that is the OCTC piece, we haven't gotten to it yet. So that's that's this piece, and again, Steve just gave us a rather big number, I think 79, 50, maybe 79, one time for IT that's not included. So now if you go forward, Louisa. You can see here, I think this is what you're asking for. We are at 163.50 with no IT. And in the ne next couple of slides, I and mean, we can skip to this now, but we are asking, is this amount too high? And if so, should we start identifying areas to reduce or eliminate? and getting into this conversation about how to structure the fees. So I, it is all coming and we can jump into it right now, <laughs> but we, we did have a couple of other areas. I think it's important that we at least go through OCTC um, and then you know maybe just dive right into this piece, but it is here. Okay. Yes, Trustee Shelby. I, um, you know, I, I appreciate um, Trustee Huser's comments because I'm getting a little confused in all of this. And, you know, I, I'm not an attorney, so I say this respectfully. I would say let's just go for all of it, right? Because it doesn't, doesn't impact me. But as I think about it and I think about the challenges what I do know is the legislative process, and I and I understand the multiplicity of things that are sitting on their laps. And so one of the things that I was just sitting here, and, and let me say this, certainly appreciate all of the time and effort that has gone into educating us, because I think this is critical and important. But I think we've got to really just sort of get to brass and tacks. Um, and if there was a way of putting this in a simple document and again, with just my public affairs background, the way that I'm thinking about this is what we have, what we need, and what we can live with. Because I don't think we'll have the benefit of, with all that the legislature has to deal with, and even their staff, of really being able to walk them through in depth of all of what our needs are. And I think we've got to get really clear. You know, we know what we have. We know what we need, but we need to get real clear on what it is that we can live with to understand that we're looking at 114 in operations and another 49, and then we're not really clear on what the technology piece is. But we know that there have been some, I'm trying to say this the right way, but we know that there are some potential risks as it relates to technology. We should have full clarity in terms of what that overall number looks like. Um, and so I think something, a docu one page document that just sort of articulates that would be helpful um, because I don't know if we're going to have the opportunity to really get into the weeds for the people who are ultimately going to make the decision. Thank you. I, I wholeheartedly agree. And I think the board could decide today we should have um, a request that includes sustaining cooperations, OCTC, and IT. That's it. You could say we want no more um, than $150 total fee increase request. So I, I think we are, you know, what, what we've done is we've identified costs um, associated with each of the areas that have come up previously as priority uh, areas for investment. And so now it's time, I think, to make those kinds of decisions and give us that direction as we pull together the final report, because these numbers are very high. To me, I'm not comfortable. I would not support 
putting forward a request this high. But this is kind of how we're making, you know, we're making the sausage right now. And so, um, so we need that kind of input. So if I could just kind of quickly get through this, allow Ewen to give you an overview of the case processing standards piece, because this is really important to tee up the conversation about OCTC needs. And then we could just go into prioritization, how we want to get to finalizing what we're actually going to ask for. So, um, and, this, and, let, yeah. and let me just interject. I appreciate that, Leah, and I hear exactly what you're saying. I guess my challenge is I don't have anything in front of me that allows me to see the totality of what our priorities and our needs are. And so maybe that's the document that is coming, but my concern is that I, I'm a visual learner. And so if I had a document sitting in front of me that outlined in one page, everything as it relates to the priorities. And, and, and you know, uh, and, and I want to say this, and I say this respectfully to the leadership team. I understand that as a board, we are focused on governance and policy, but you all have the benefit of seeing this from day to day. So as you raise the priorities, then we need to make the tough decisions in terms of what it is we're going to embrace as a board. And right now, for me, I'm seeing that there is the one priority of the operations, but there are these expanded priorities. And I understand everything is a priority, but again, for me, what we have, what we need, and what we can live with, that's sort of the prism of which I'm thinking through this. Okay. I would just suggest that what we at need at this juncture is the sustaining corporations. That's 114. I think there's some flexibility there with respect to the PTO accruals potentially, but that is what we need. And what we want is expanding impact. So I think that's a safe way to look at it. Everything under expanding impact is truly expanding our impact. And so if we don't get any of it, we are not gonna need to lay off staff. We're not gonna need to default on our lease, none of that. So just in terms of a very high level frame, what we need is the 114. What we want is all this other stuff that you can see is getting us to 49.50 now without the IT piece, which has come in with a number that we would all agree is not viable. So that's kind of you know where we are hot off the presses today. Okay, you good, Trustee Shelby. Okay, uh, yes, Trustee Huser. Just very quickly, that was extraordinarily helpful framing. Um, that last that we need the 114 and the rest of this is a little bit more discretionary. Obviously, there's a need for this stuff too, but um, that was extraordinarily helpful. What I would also like to see, and maybe somebody can throw it together while we're going through the rest of this, is what is then the total fee increase and what, what are various groups of lawyers going to be expected to pay um, in total, where we are now, what we're adding, what we may discretionarily add, because I think that amount, when it gets out to actual human beings paying it, is also relevant. So I'd love to see that. Okay. okay. I've just asked Justin to work on that. Um, so again, continuing with the what we want, um, this uh, trustee Tony is in response to your request we have costed out a resumption of in-person meetings. This is in-person meetings for all the sub-entities and the board that are in the general fund. So it's not just the board. And this amount does include a, a, a one-time cost that should have been made clear for uh, upgrading our San Francisco space so that we can hold meetings here. If we do resume meetings in person, they will need to be both in LA and San Francisco. And so there's some language here about what we're doing currently with sub entities meeting uh, two times a year in person, the board four, that's what we're currently budgeted for, and then what the impact would be of transitioning back. Um, and, you know, we did this very last minute, so there's some cleanup that needs to be done to back out costs that are already budgeted in 2025. Um, that's this item. I think we can move forward. The Jenny Commission, this is one we've discussed on a number of occasions. Um, you can see here the full cost for the state bar to operate the Jenny Commission, $1.2 million a year or $575 per active licensee. 
we can move forward, Louisa. OCTC. Okay, I'm going to turn things over to Ewen. Ewen George and I thought it would make sense for her to go over the case processing standards report that, again, is a companion report to the fee increase request. And then we'll turn it back to George to walk through what exactly the OCTC component of our expanding impact request is. So, Ewen, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Uh, this presentation will focus on OCTC's performance and OCTC's step needs analysis. So uh, the three questions we will raise for your feedback and input at the end of the presentation, I want to highlight them here. So when I go through the slides, you can think about uh, those three questions. First, what staffing increase should we request? Again, just for OCTC. Uh, should we consider a phased staffing request? If phased, how should that request be uh, structured? So the discussion will cover three parts. The first part is SB 40's requirement on update on OCTC's most recent performance. The second one is staffing needs analysis. The third one is we had a deep look at the OCTC workforce, and we think about what factors could impact our fee, uh, OCTC fee uh, request. Then uh, in SB 40, the specifically asked to, uh, for an update on the changes made to case disciplinary processes and the assessment of those uh, the impact of those changes. They also ask for a discussion uh, how efficiency concerns were addressed uh, by the state bar, uh, which was which were raised by uh, the state auditor and the LAO office. So I will quickly go through the changes that have been made by OCTC. George provided a list of 52 programs that have been implemented since year 2020. And you can see the spread out of those programs. The reason I want to spread them out is to give everybody a sense that some programs that they just uh, recently implemented, for example, REORG, we don't know the uh, short-term and the long-term impact of some of the programs yet. Another point I really want to make is even there are 50, there are 52 programs implemented, uh, but they vary in size, complexity, and the impact. They are categorized in four areas, organizational policy uh, uh, slash procedure, technology, and staffing. Some of the programs programs may have negative impact on efficiency, on how, how fast the cases can be processed. For, for example, conflict uh, of interest check. It's intended to protect the public. However, to implement this procedure and policy that requires staff's additional time, I, I hear my own echo. Um, that requires staff's additional time to fill out the form, upload the document. Uh, so just to give uh, everybody a sense, some programs could delay the, pro uh, the case processing. Uh, then um, I'm not going to go to the specific changes that have been made. You, you can uh, see the report for some details. Uh, but I want to um, talk about the impact of those changes. We have two major uh, indicators for impact. One is called productivity, which is operationalized as the case is closed per year. I want to draw your attention to this number. So in 2023, the case is closed by OCTC uh, is comparable to 2018 pre-pandemic level. It went up and down, but mostly stable. So it's fair to say that uh, in the past six years, the productivity remained stable. Then another thing is case processing speed, whether we have processed cases faster or slower. Then um, in intake, cases close to intake, we had uh, 18%, this should be switched. We had 18% decrease uh, in, in time, which is good. We, we processed uh, uh, cases closing intake faster. In investigation, we had a 8% decrease, which is also good. 
than in charging, which um, comprised 4% of total cases, we had a significant time increase, which is not good. We want process uh, cases faster. So that's the overall picture of uh, OCTC's uh, performance. Then SB40, the legislature wanted to see how uh, is the current speed um, uh, compared against the SB211 standards. So this is the current speed by stage. 37 average days for cases closed in intake. The standard set in SB211 proposal is 30 days. Uh, some gaps, but not far. Uh, investigation 210 is the current speed. At, on average, uh, staff spent 210 days. Uh, the target speed is 180. Um, then charging, you can see it's a big gap there. But again, I want to give you the full picture. Those two stages, uh, they comprised 96% of cases. So the dominant majority of cases, they were processed faster. Then um, another um, uh, way to look at the OCTC performance relatively to the standards is to look at the six categories which we proposed in SB211 proposal. And uh, uh, you can see, again, we look at the intake, you can look at different categories in investigation, the gap between the current speed and the target speed, and again, uh, charging. We, we almost need to double the speed in charging to meet the standard. Uh, then SB40 also required us to report hearing time, which took place in a, a state bar court. Uh, uh, overall picture is, in the past six over the past six years, the number of cases uh, ha that were processed in hearing uh, has decreased, uh, but the speed that went went through hearing also decreased. Uh, the, the the speed um, uh, was improved, meaning the days were decreased, which is good. So it used to be one ninety one days for cases went through hearing or closed in hearing. Now it's one hundred seventy seven days. Which is, which is the time spent in a uh, state bar court. However, if you look at the cases uh, from when they were opened in OCTC to uh, when they were closed or, pro or processed in hearing, it's, it's significantly increased. And we know the reason because the charging uh, has slowed down. Then another way to look at OCTC performance against the SB211 standards is the backlog. And uh, the in SB211 standards, we propose 10% of backlog, backlog standards. We, we propose that no more than 10% of cases, no matter which category they were in, uh, go, go beyond the proposed backlog timeline. Uh, the, the current, the current uh, performance is 27% of cases, closed cases, were in backlog uh, status. Not ideal, but still comparable to previous years. Uh, 27, so went up and down 27% again. Now, pending is, in my uh, opinion, is the most troublesome picture here. Pending backlog is the cases that are still pending, but they are already in backlog status. 36% in year 2023 uh, that were uh, in backlog stand, uh, uh, status in pending uh, inventory, only 21% uh, uh, in 2018. So the overall picture is that we um, made some progress in terms of closing uh, uh, cases in intake and investigation. Uh, Productivity-wise, we remain, the, remain stable, however, the older cases in pending backlog keeps accumulating, and that's related with the staffing uh, request we're going to make. So uh, staffing needs analysis, we use two methodologies, and they were both introduced and proposed in the SB211 standards. Uh, the first methodology we call the linear model. We request 48 FTEs. For, for what goal? The goal is to meet the SB211 standards average case processing standards and the closed backlog standards. Then we look at the pending uh, because even we can meet the SB211 standards, we have those cases keep accumulating in the pending uh, backlog. It used to be 1,000 cases here in 2018, now 2,500, 2.5 times more 
than uh, what were in backlog uh, in 2018 in pending inventory. And percentage-wise, again, you have seen this number. So to ask for staff members 48 is to meet the standards. Then we asked additional 27 to reduce this pending backlog back to 20% goal. So we, we are saying if we want to reduce the pending backlog from 37% to 20% in five years, we need a 27 additional staff members. So 27 plus 48 here, which is 75 uh, FTE in OCTC to reach those two goals. Then uh, another methodology I mentioned uh, is uh, called workload and time study. Basically, the methodology is to have the random moment survey, give that to staff members and collect the time they spend on uh, the milestone tasks, the important tasks. And we collect that time, we present that time to, uh, to staff members and ask them how much do they want adjust to reach the goal of having a healthy and a manageable uh, workload. And the staff members uh, propose 25% uh, adjustment, which uh, means we need to ask for 77 additional FTE. So the two methodologies, one is 75. This one, we ask for 77, pretty close. Uh, we also look at some other factors to truly understand how we, uh, when we ask for this staffing request, how should we structure them? Uh, one thing, uh, the overall picture is uh, in 2018, we had filled position 230. In 2023, we had 289. We had 59 additional uh, uh, FTE in OCTC. But if you recall productivity uh, over the uh, past six years, remained stable. If you recall the time, we improved the time uh, for investigate for uh, intake and the investigation clo uh, closed cases. So that's that's uh, the historical trend. Uh, we also look at uh, how long did we take to even you know fill those positions, and we look at uh, uh, how long uh, OCTC attorneys and the investigators stay. Uh, in the state bar. And the picture is the majority, which is here, which is 77% of attorneys, they have less than ten, less than six years of tenure in the state bar. So they, they are, they are uh, uh, relatively inexperienced uh, workforce here. Uh, the investigators, which is also the majority, 63% uh, of investigators, have uh, less than six years uh, experience. Then we look at the turnover rate, which we have already discussed a bit uh, in, uh, in the previous uh, presentation. Now, George will uh, discuss with you what kind of staff you increase uh, would make sense. And George, please take over. Sure. So if you look at the two staffing needs analysis, they basically come out in essentially the same place, um, roughly a total of 75 to 77 positions to both um, try and meet the SB211 standards and to reduce our pending inventory. Um, that's a huge number of people. Um, and uh, I think it highly unlikely would get those all at once for a number of reasons. But among the number of reasons is that one of the things that the legislature asked us to do in this was to look at um, procedural and operational changes so we could get a sense of have those actually improved efficiency. We made a large number of changes this last year, and particularly we did a significant reorganization of OCTC to try and address some efficiency concerns that were raised by the Legislative Analyst's Office, um, in particular to differentiate amongst, amongst types of cases and the teams that we have handling those types of cases to try and make it more efficient. We obviously don't see the results of that yet because we just started that in July of 2023, so we just don't have data on that. So. This then raises the question, A, we could never hire and absorb 77 positions in one year. Um, B, it's unclear that that would make sense because hopefully we will have some efficiencies that might change that number if we look at the data in future years to take account of our efficiency improvements. And so the next question, should we consider a phased staffing request? Our recommendation is yes um, to address all of those concerns. 
Um, and in particular, if we are going to request between 75 and 77 positions, my strong suggestion would be that that be phased and that that be over some period of time, potentially three years, an annual increment of 25 positions each year, which has a number of benefits. A, that's a number of staff that we could realistically try to hire and absorb in a given year. But I think it's important to remember that the impacts of those staff additional staff will not be fully felt in that first year because there is a significant um, training and experience component before someone gets to the position where they can fully contribute to OCTC's mission. So basically, you know, we, we account for essentially a three-month training period when people are not really contributing that much in terms of productivity, six months in which they reduced productivity, by the end of the first year, we hope that they're starting to get up to being fully productive, but realistically, it's somewhere between one and a half to three years before someone is sufficiently familiar with the subject area and the procedures to be a fully effective staff member. Um, so breaking into three increments would give us a number of advantages. One, it would allow us to hire. Two, it would allow us each year then to look back at what that additional staffing has accomplished over the last year what our additional efficiency improvements have accomplished, for example, implementation of the diversion program, the implementation of the reorganization, and come back with data that might conceivably suggest that, you know, we don't need the full amount of the second tier, or we don't need the full amount of the third tier, depending upon what the data shows as we continue to move forward. Um, so for all those reasons, the recommendation would be that we do do a phased request and that we request that there be essentially in connection with each of the next phases, a subsequent review of the data um, with potentially a subsequent adjustment and or an explanation of why that data continues to suggest that we need the additional phases of staffing. Uh, are we open to questions now? I see Trustee, Trustee Huser has a question. I can wait if you're not done, go ahead, sorry. Oh, we are done. This is our last slide. Okay. Well, then um, my question is, I mean, I find these numbers, I just have to be honest, as a, I manage a, a global litigation program with thousands of cases on the docket. They range everything from small claims to giant matters um, in a company that... Um, has a lot of funds, and so I'm not worried about funding and operating at a deficit. We have six lawyers and eight staff, and we get through these matters. So to see these numbers, to me, is shocking. Um, to, to request an additional 77 people to have numbers, I can't remember what they were, just having seen the slide for a moment of several hundred, um, is shocking to me. And so I wonder what, I know you all are coming into this, you come in midstream, you've got the backlog, all of this, no one's to blame for that, but what are we doing to make sure we can do something differently? Because in my mind, we cannot afford, because we don't have the money for it, you can only spend what you have, can't afford to be adding dozens and dozens of, of staff but yet, I understand your problem in terms of you've got this backlog, but what are we doing to, to assess how we handle these cases or whether we just deal with some of them, you know, like you talked about earlier, the diversion program or that kind of thing. I, I'm just, I, I'm shocked by these numbers. Yeah, so I mean, that's that's a much lengthier discussion in terms of kind of how we handle the cases, what we do with the cases, um, and what we've done to try and speed that up. I mean, we have made a number of changes. As I mentioned, we did this significant reorganization in July to try and, um, uh, based on some recommendations from the Legislative Analyst's Office, address some of the efficiency concerns. Um, you know, the secondary component is that you know, there are some things that we are required to do with respect to each and every case that take large amounts of time for each case. So, for example, for each and every case, even if it's a very minor allegation of misconduct, we have to draft a closing letter that explains what the allegations were, why we have decided to close those sufficiently thorough that that provides a record 
to enable if they to seek review either in crew or in the Supreme Court that there's a basis for the court to conclude that we appropriately close that. And so we have to do that in each and every one of the cases that we handle every year. And that takes an inordinate amount of time. Um, are there efficiencies that we could do to do that? You know, we've done various things to try and do that. So for example, we recently revised and came up with a new list of standard form closing language to try and address many of the more similar complaints that we get. That's now in place. Do we know how that's going to impact us going forward? No, because we just put that in place. Um, so it's kind of this constant we're constantly looking at what we do and trying to make adjustments to try and do it more efficiently and more effectively. Um, but I will say, you know, there have been other workload studies in the past um, that also suggested the need for additional resources along these lines, and they weren't granted. Um, and I think that's in part what we see over the last six years of the inventory increasing. Um, you know, because we can try and make it as efficient as we want, but at the same time, we're tasked with, you know, being making sure that we are thorough and complete in each and every investigation so that we never have another Girardi again. Um, and those are intention. <laughs> um, and, you know, the diversionist program is an effort to address that in a way. The reorganization is an effort to address that in a way. But to a large extent, we're nibbling around the edges. Um, in terms of getting that down. Um, so we, to go back to the language that Trustee Shelby said, you know, uh, need, have, want, you know, we could muddle along with what we've got, but I would expect that if we muddle along with what we've got right now, you're going to see the inventory continue to increase and we'll try to keep the case processing times the same, but potentially they might increase. Um, with with a, some increase in staffing, we might be able to bring down one or the other, but you know those are kinds of choices. Um, not sure that really answers your question, but I think that's probably the best I can do right now without kind of going into a much more thorough analysis of what we do and how. Yeah, it does. It does respond to my question, and I appreciate the pickle that you're in. That said, I think we have to figure out how we can do something. And that may involve asking the legislature to do something. Not every case is a Girardi. We don't have to treat everyone with a scorched earth mentality if it means that we can't get the work done on, on the volume. So there's, I appreciate the situation you're in, but I think just personally adding at that level of headcount is not the answer. All right, before we get to other comments, I do want to do a time check here. It's 1247. We're budgeted to go through 1 uh, p.m. I understand that everybody has schedules to adhere to. Um, Leah, just to kind of give us an idea of what we still need to discuss, um, can you just tell us what's left on the agenda just for this item? And then we can have a discussion um, as a board on whether we continue later on past one o'clock today or uh, continue this, um, this meeting um, until, you know, time that works for for everybody or a majority of of everybody so we um are slated after this slide is the table that i showed earlier that outlines the total dollar amounts um, for each of the components of the um expanding impact and then the grand total then um, just in case we have staff who's worked up you know your request for the total total so we'll have that amount we need to make some, they really need to get board direction on what the ultimate component should be of this request. Basically, which should we strike and eliminate at this point? Don't continue working it up, right? Because the number is just too big. Um, so there's that. And then there's the whole conversation about how to structure the licensing fee itself. Trustee Huser referred to that, but we have options for what I would call progressive fee structures, practice sector based income-based, years of practice-based. We sent out a survey last week to our licensees. We have about 9,000 responses. So we do have a little bit of input from uh, attorneys and we have some models to show you about what, what that would look like. So, um, so we need you guys to give us direction on what's in and what's out, as well as the structure for assessing the fees 
that we're going to recommend, understanding we could recommend more than one if that's the direction of the board. So those are kind of the two um, big conversation pieces to be had. So it sounds like we potentially could go another hour with these discussion items. I just want to get a show of hands. Um, are you able to stay an extra hour? Okay, who is not able to do an extra hour? Let, let's do it that way. So we've got Trustee Stevens is unable to see Trustee Trejo, potentially Trustee Shelby, Trustee Huser, Trustee Buenaventura. Okay, so that's a significant, oh, and Trustee Good, I think. So that's a significant um, majority. So if we're going to try to continue, I've, I, you know, we have the GC here and our board secretary, we can try this model where we don't have to wait 10 days. We could kind of figure out what the board's availability is now and continue the meeting, maybe set a, a one hour conversation. I think this has been, you know, you, you're really ready probably to get into the discussion. We could in that time do the one pager that trustee Shelby has requested, put up the totals and just like launch right into the conversation. All right, so do we have some dates lined up that might work? Did you have your hand up, Trustee Shelby? I I, I did. I um but you outlined kind of the next steps in a in a very succinct way. I thought the conversation was great, but I didn't think, you know, I was under the impression that coming to this discussion, we were going to get to some nitty gritty. And so I want to make sure that the next time we get together, because it feels like there were a number of things that we were asked to respond to. I hope the materials are even more comprehensive and that we really give ourselves enough time to have this discussion because it really is an important one. And and so I'm hoping that all of the staff presentations have transpired and that the board finally gets an opportunity to have a conversation. Thank you. So as far as the direction that you need, Leah, what is the kind of last possible moment for that to have transpired by? I think it would be best from a staff perspective if we could try to um, find a time to continue this this week. Um, just given that we have to turn finals around for you for the March meeting. So I don't I don't know the best way to do that. I don't know, Louisa, if you have a great way, maybe voting options on um, through Outlook right now um yes and we're looking at a meeting for this week right and maybe we should schedule it for two hours i don't mm -hmm. think we need two hours but that way we have yes. enough time yes. yeah so i'm wondering in the evening would that be the most common commonly available time slot i know we try not to do that but this with the interest of time see trustee shelby saying no, Trustee Barahona is saying yes. Let me ask this question um, th through the chair. Is this a conversation that we can have at our board meeting when we are sitting together in March? And is it a situation that, because I feel like there's a piece that's missing here. I feel like the piece that's missing is the prioritization that comes from the senior leadership team. I understand that you all want us to make some decisions, but I feel like for myself, I need you all to make some of the tough sort of the tough sort of operational decisions to say, okay, I've looked at my organization and this is what I can live with, this is what I cannot live with. And I feel like if that sort of conversation would transpire first, then I would certainly feel comfortable saying, yay, nay, stay. But I, I feel like for me, that's the piece that's missing. 
think um, I, I think we have we we have started to do that in subsequent slides, but we don't have time to get through them. And um, I think waiting to the March meeting would be too late because we need you to approve the reports in March, unless you want to try to have a special meeting after the March meeting to approve the reports, but they are due April 1st. And I believe your March meeting is the 21st and 22nd. So there's just not a lot of time there on the back end. Um, so certainly for this continued discussion that we're talking about, we can be more upfront about staff recommendations. I think it would be you know, very helpful for the board to set kind of a cap and maybe you need that. Um, you need us to give you the what must we have first before you can think about your cap number. So I think we can come with that in mind to the next meeting, but I, I don't think unfortunately we can wait until the March meeting. Trustee Tony. One quick comment. Um, you asked the question, is this number too much? the bottom line, 163, whatever it was, I was going to ask the opposite question, is it enough? Because I noted that technology is not in there at all. It is excluded. So either technology is important or it's not. If it's important, it needs to be in there. That's my comment. Or else it should be taken out completely from the report. All right, so definitely another thing to discuss. So. Louise, are you working on something here? Yes, I'm putting together a quick poll, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Um, a few options for a meeting during the day and then also in the evening for two hours. So uh, if you just give me like two minutes, I'll have that prepared. Would it be helpful during that two minutes to talk about anything in particular? I could I could talk about maybe um, responding to your comment, Trustee Tony. I think it is both too much, and I think we need to include IT. So I think it means some other areas are going to have to come out, and we will come back with clear staff recommendations. In this deck, you have I think we note you know some initial recommendations to remove Jenny convert the EOB fee, move it out of the fee increase discussion and move it over into a conversion to a mandatory fee, and then to eliminate the in-person meetings. We can go further there. Um, you, you may have, like if I had to say today on the spot, I'd say OCTC and IT, and then our sustaining core operations, and that's probably what I would say are our must-dos. Um, so, that's where we are. And as Steve mentioned, we are having this IT request vetted by a third party consultant um, that has worked with state government and state auditor in particular. So that will be very instructive uh, what we get back on that. Okay, so poll should be coming. Trustee Barahona, did I see your hand? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, would it be advantageous to um, try to move the attorney representation pilot um, and get that sort of funded uh, privately, like through a foundation or a, a group of foundations and take that out entirely out of the expanding impact? I'm just curious if that would be advantageous to go to the legislature with and say, we wanted this and we actually are, are getting it funded this an another way. And here are some interested parties. I think that's Again, our way to um, uh, to bring additional revenue in and, and partnerships that would certainly get behind that. I think it's a good idea. I don't know if by April 1st we can say we've gotten the commitment, but we can say that's the intent. Is in yes. yes. Okay. Uh, I'm working on it. Mr. Chair, this is Arnie. Uh, do we do you need to get through the consent calendar today as well? I would most likely trail to the next the, to our continued meeting. Okay. Unless staff, unless we need to approve it to the, any item today. George, no, no. 
Okay, trustees, you should have received the poll with um, several options for our meeting. All right, hopefully everybody's had a chance to fill that out. I'm checking responses and we do not have a quorum just yet. I believe we need one more response. Let me see. Did we lose Melanie? Oh, there you are. Yeah. I think my only availability was Friday from 11 to 1. That was it. Okay. Louisa, I'm going to have to wait um, for me to respond just because there's some stuff that's fluid on my calendar that I know that I'm not completely up to speed on. So the kids are going to have to help me with that. Okay. Just... I think in order for us to do this, we have to adjourn today to a specific date and time. That's correct. Um, so, Louisa, what is the what's the one with the most clo the closest to getting us a quorum? I think we'll have to pick that and hope that it'll work. Already okay. Okay. Looks like um, let me just March first from one to three. So, Brian, uh, Trustee Stalling, are you okay if we do the adjourning to that date and time, and then we will individually reach out to folks and maybe see if we can yep. muster a quorum? Yes, I am. I move to recess this meeting until March 1st at 1 o'clock. Thank you for that motion. Trustee Tony, is there a second? Second. Second. Second by Vice Chair Cisneros. I might have a roll call vote, please. Barahona. Aye. Buenaventura. Aye. Chen. Not present. Cisneros. Aye. Good. Aye. Huser. Aye. Shelby. Aye. Stevens? Aye. Sowell? 
Aye. Tony? Aye. Trejo? Aye. Stallings? Aye. 11 ayes, zero nays, motion carries. Just chair, for just for clarification, that was motion to adjourn, correct? To the specified time and date. It, it was motion to recess to the time and date. Is it I'm so right? sorry to have not, I'm so sorry for not have heard that earlier, but I would, you know, it would be cleaner if we do a motion to adjourn. There you go. To, yeah. okay. uh, but I think that, I think we could make the argument that has been done at least in the spirit of the right. Bagley King Act. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Okay.